Um, welcome to up here, um, analysis of PPEs and atmospheric uh, research. So I just wanted to uh, kick things off with a, just a few slides to set the scene for, for why we're here and what we, uh, what we want to achieve. Um, so the uh, first question is really why this meeting, where, where the idea came from. Um, so we've been mulling for some time that, you know, there are two issues here that for, for in particular climate modeling and all the other modeling that goes into to understanding of the atmosphere and climate. And it's really about fidelity and reliability. I think these are the two grand challenges. And um, they both have different approaches. You know, you can't solve both of them with exactly the same approach, but there are really quite different views on the on the priorities for, for ways forward, you know, greater mod model resolution, more complexity, you know, adding more processes, um, meteorological ensembles, parameter ensembles, etc. So there's always a question of where our priorities should be and where we need to put our effort if we're going to improve fidelity and, and reliability of, of models in general. So per, per parameter ensembles, which is the topic of this meeting, can make, definitely make a major contribution, but they're often seen too narrowly. Um, you know, if you ask someone or they give, if they choose to give you their opinion on your work on, on PPEs, it's often, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, but it's just one model. And, uh, you know, there's lots of other things we need to worry about. And, and then they move on. So I think um, that's not my view. It's not um, the view of lots of people who work with these. And what we'll see at this meeting is there's a lot more to PPEs than just understanding, understanding parameter effects. Now, we can look at model responses and sensitivities. People use them to develop process level understanding, um, quantifying constraining uncertainty, but also the thing that's often stated that you can't do, and that's model structural deficiency. Um, so you can get some insights into the causes of structural deficiency, and I think that's going to emerge from some of the talks. And also model, model simplification. You know, if you find that certain parameters don't matter, not sensitive, then you can explore model simplification. So that and a lot more um, you can do with PPEs. So we really felt that there was a, a need for a meeting pulling all this um, uh, together. So the, the aims of the meeting are to, first of all, showcase the wide range of um, PPE related um, research. So, you know, we, we just want to kind of have a show and tell. We don't, we, we're, we're aware of a lot of what's going on, but we don't know everything. Um, so we just want to see. So that's really a, an important part of it. Um, and a wide range of applications uh, across atmospheric science is really a really wide range. Um, and also across model types and scales. So quite often you go to meetings where there'll be a climate modeling session where PPE work might pop up. Um, but here we want to bring PPEs together across all the different types of models and, and scales. And I think we have a really incredible range over the next couple of days. Um, to share our expertise, um, building PPEs, analyzing them, what you can do with them, the information you can extract from them. Um, we're always looking at other people's work to see what they can, they're doing that we could do. So I think just pulling all that together and just sharing that expertise would be immensely useful uh, for everybody. Because uh, most groups are actually quite new to building PPEs, um, whereas some have been doing it for, for maybe a decade. Uh, build a community of researchers. You know, we're interested to see whether there is a community or is the community still, you know, cloud modelers and climate modelers, or is there a community of people doing this kind of, of research that we could um, begin to coordinate a bit better. Um, and then to, in this meeting, to begin to scope out some of the opportunities for development of this area, for collaboration, and also then contribution to these grand challenges. You know, how can we as a community, if we are a community, contribute to um, at least one of these grand challenges on uh, model reliability. Um, and then the end point, we really want to write a perspective article to inform the community. And this is something we'll do together with, um, with Nico and others at WCRP to make sure we're all getting our ducks in a line and um, speaking in a common voice. Um, yeah, so that's the aims of the meeting. Um, it's really over to you now to, to um, show us what you're doing, and then we'll have some discussions later uh, today. You've all got the program. So just some reminders, please keep to time. Um, I'll give you, I'm the chair of the first session. I'll give you a six minute verbal warning. Um, you've used six minutes, and then you want to please wrap up in eight. 
and we'll have, if we have time, a couple of minutes for discussion, uh, or I'm sorry, a couple of minutes for direct questions. Um, a reminder, we are recording. Um, Nico, maybe you want to say in a moment what, what will happen with that recording, why we're recording. Um, please use the etherpad for discussion. Um, you have the link on the, on the uh, program. It's a really good way of, of beginning to open discussion on each talk, as well as other things. Um, make some, if you are able, make some specific suggestions for things you want to see brought up again in the, in the online, in, in the um, discussion here. Questions for the speakers, put those in the Zoom chat, but please don't just chat. Um, you know how distracting that is at a meeting. So put, put direct questions you want to ask them, we'll come back to them. Your chat should be in the etherpad if you've not used it before. It's a good place to do that. Um, yeah, join the Wonder Me social area. Uh, if you, once you've got yourself a cup of tea, of course, and don't uh, forego your cup of tea to, to join, but we should um, gather there if you, if you want. Um, and then a reminder that at the end of today and the end of tomorrow's session, we will have the option for other participants who are not showing to bring in one slide to show if you want to illustrate your point. Join the discussions any way you want, but it will be fine to show uh, one slide. Um, and that's for tomorrow. That's for later on the discussion. OK, yeah, maybe Nico, what are we doing with the recording? Where will it go? Will it be available publicly or? Uh, my suggestion is for you guys to, to, to decide, but I think uh, we agreed that perhaps for those who could not join today because of time zones, yeah. then we can make it available for participants only. Yeah. Um, for sure. So that, that would be a, a way to, to, to go. Uh, probably this, this, uh, this recording will be available tomorrow morning at some point or even uh, later today so i'll try to make available for for you guys um sooner rather than later that's okay that's great. great great yeah thank you so if, yeah a few more 10 people joined while i was speaking so we have a good group of people now yeah so um let's uh let's get uh cracking with the agenda let me just quickly uh put that up um orientate ourselves Uh, so yeah, we're here at 1500 UTC. So we have um, five talks now um, before the break. We'll have a short break. Then we'll have, um, I think, four or five more, um, or maybe six more before we have another break. And then we'll have discussion. Um, so the first speaker um, is um, Anghara um, Stel, Stel. Maybe you tell you how to pronounce that. Gaussian process emulation of the uh, methane budget. Then we jump onto clouds, then we jump into global models. So we're really going to jump around and enjoy ourselves exploring all these different science areas and applications. Okay, uh, Ayhara, are you ready to, to share? Yes, let me just get it up. Can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Cool. So yes, hi everyone, I'm Anharad and I'm going to be taking you on a whistle-stop tour of our recent work where we were approximating a chemical transport model to learn more about the global methane budget. So this has already been published in ACP if you want to have a look at it in more detail. Um, so just to start us off, these are the measurements of global methane mole fraction that have been taken by NOAA and in particular a large amount of attention has been paid to this plateau in the growth rate around 2000, 2007. Um, and alongside these methane mole fraction measurements, there are also measurements of the carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio within um, atmospheric methane, which should help us figure out changes in growth rate because different sources and sinks affect this ratio differently. So loads of different studies have looked into what the cause of this change in growth rate could be. And we actually end up with a lot of different, almost contradictory solutions with several studies suggesting different sources or the sink of methane. So there's clearly quite a lot of work to be done to make sure that we can do accurate global modeling studies and have adequate uncertainty quantification. So in order to have a look at this, we created a perturbed parameter ensemble for the Mozart model, which is a global chemical transport model. 
Uh, this was run at a resolution of 12 degrees by 11.25 degrees with 56 vertical levels. Uh, we had 28 parameters covering the magnitude of methane sources, as well as the delta 13 C signatures of methane sources, the magnitude of losses, temporal trend variation for the largest emissions and losses, as well as initial conditions. And by varying those 28 parameters, we generated a set of 270 simulations for training Gaussian processes, as well as an independent 90 simulations for testing. And we also had another 90 simulations where we varied uh, the nine invariant parameters, so just parameters that we had fixed. So these were some minor sources and losses to see the effect of changing them. Once we had all these simulations, the model outputs were combined to hemispheric mole fraction and delta 13 C values, which consist of monthly mean, 13 year long time series. And these outputs were then used to generate Gaussian process emulators, which could approximate the Mozart output very quickly and also produce an associated error. We then went on to do a sensitivity analysis in our paper, but we have also experimented with doing inversions with it to derive methane emissions, although that part of the work has not been published yet. Okay, so here we have four outputs that we were emulating. So we have Southern Hemisphere mole fraction, Northern Hemisphere mole fraction, Southern Hemisphere delta value, Northern Hemisphere delta value. And before we go ahead and use our emulator, we need to make sure that it's accurate and useful. So for that to be true, we need to make sure that the emulator error is a minor contributor to the total error that we have. And whilst it's really difficult to quantify the error in a complex model, here we created a lower bound for the model error by looking at the effects that, have, that those invariant parameters can have on the output. And just by taking a, a standard deviation of that, 90 simulations where we varied the invariant parameters. Uh, we've generated an invariant parameter error, which is shown here in as a blue line for these four. And you know, can then compare that to the emulator error, which is shown in green. And by combining them, you can get a total error shown in black. And as you can see, it's, it's largely dominated by the invariant parameter error for these outputs. Um, and actually, this invariant parameter error is a substantial source of previously unconsidered uncertainty. So that's something that we need to look into more. OK, so we can also have a look at how well our Gaussian process is performing by comparing its ability to emulate the model compared to something simpler, such as multiple linear regression, uh, which assumes that the relationship between inputs and outputs is linear and that parameters do not interact, unlike the Gaussian process. Uh, so we can get a Gaussian process and multiple linear regression to predict the model output for the test data set that we have, and then look at the difference between the emulation method and the model, which is shown here for a mole fraction on the left-hand side and delta value on the right-hand side. So the Gaussian process is shown in grey, the residuals for that, uh, and the multiple linear regression residuals are shown in as kind of orange. And you can see that the Gaussian process has a much smaller range of residuals, in particular for mole fraction. Um, so by assuming that relationship between inputs and outputs is linear and the parameters don't interact, as several other previous studies have done, that's another potentially important source of error to look into. So hopefully you're happy that the emulator is useful, and now we're going to try and use it. So in our paper, we carried out a variance-based sensitivity analysis, which typically requires millions of simulations, uh, which is only going to be possible with using an emulator. So this type of sensitivity analysis allows a full exploration of the parameter space and accounts for parameter interactions. And in this plot here, uh, this just shows first order sensitivity indices. So that's the percentage of output variance caused by varying that parameter alone. So we've just got six outputs here in these six plots and the 28 parameters that we vary are along the bottom. Uh, for the outputs, we have a mole fraction on the left hand side and delta value on the right hand side. First row is a global mean, the second row is in terms of difference and the third row is trend. Um, so obviously there's quite a lot going on here, just going to pick out a few key bits. Uh, so when we look at the mole fraction, one of the largest, most important parameters that shows up is the hydroxyl radical loss. Um, it's not very surprising given that it is the largest single term in the methane budget. 
but we also see other parameters having an important impact. So freshwater emissions, uh, which are really hugely uncertain and often left out of some modeling studies. Six minutes. Yeah. Uh, and on the right hand side with the delta value, we've got loads of different terms here that are contributing to the sensitivity, including those that the model fraction is insensitive to. So this should be a useful complementary measurement. And we see things like the chlorine loss of methane, um, which again can sometimes left out of studies and a, a quite a strong dependence on initial conditions. So that's important to think about too. Uh, additionally, we can look at parameter interactions with this. So that's when uh, you perturb two or more parameters simultaneously and that is, it causes a different variation in the output. However, in our case, it's actually quite small, but when we're trying to predict small quantities like in terms of difference in trends, it's important that we do include these to make sure we have an accurate emulator. So just to finish off, um, yeah, I think the main thing to take away is that it's really useful technique to have these large model um, perturbed parameter ensembles um, that we can then use to generate things like emulators. And we can very easily reproduce complicated model output with very short runtime, which allows a, a better, larger range of analyses to be carried out. Um, yeah, well, I think we'll leave it there. So thank you. Hey, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, any uh, immediate questions? I have a couple of minutes for questions. Right, can I ask you, what's the range that you get there um, compared to multiple models? Are you spending a good range? Um, yeah, so we haven't like directly compared this to other models. We only did it for the one Mozart model. Um, and we've produced, um, the parameter ranges are really quite large on this, um, partly because we wanted to use it for doing inversions later on, and therefore we needed to make sure we had kind of all of the possible parameters covered. Um, so we covered a very large amount of parameter space that you maybe wouldn't necessarily need to for some applications for this. Um, and it's, it seems to do a reasonable job of reproducing observations. So that's pretty okay, good. Thanks, Andrew. Um, very interesting. Can you say something about the third bullet, the minor sources and sinks being fixed and leading to substantial uncertainty? Is that why you went back into the other 90 simulations? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, yeah. So it was just that because we had so many parameters, we couldn't vary all of them. Um, so often in these methane modeling studies, you end up with the smaller sources and smaller sinks being ignored just because there's too many parameters. Um, so we decided to include that as kind of an invariant parameter error where we had a set of simulations where we varied the terms that would typically be fixed to have a look at how that would affect it. Um, and because things like model errors are really hard to actually get a handle on, um, this, this invariant parameter error was actually kind of the size of um, what you'd expect from observational errors as well as um, other model errors. So this term by itself would be a large contributor uh, to a kind of system error that we would be expecting that a lot of people haven't really thought about. It's just been fixed and left. Okay, thanks. A quick question maybe from Claudia. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm curious about, uh, there is some discussion in the etherpad, but um, you know, 10 times 28 parameters seems very little sampling. And still you're saying that you're uh, exploring wide ranges for these parameters. So is this a situation where the parameters have very strong dependencies and therefore you don't need to, you know, sample like with a Latin hypercube sort of approach where everything can uh, be matched with everything or is there something um, else going on? Um, so we do have a lot in hypercube. I think part of what uh, makes this problem sort of simpler is that for a lot of the like emissions, which um, go into the atmosphere, a lot of that is like basically linear. Um, the non-linearity comes from the sinks, so the, like the losses of methane in the atmosphere. Um, so those are the kind of the ones that mean that multiple linear regression and simpler stuff isn't going to work. And then in the delta values themselves, it's a bit more complicated because it's not just a, a simple like the methane goes up into the atmosphere. So I think partly because um, it's kind of simpler for the mole fractions because it is, well, a large part of that parameter space is going to be linear. So we can still get it to reproduce the 
the um, the model accurately. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, I heard. Um, next uh, up is uh, Rachel Sanson. Hello. Hello. Can you see this? That's good. Yeah, off you go. Cool. Yeah, so um, I've been creating a perturbed parameter ensemble of uh, kind of, of cloud transitions, in particular focusing on the stratocumulus to cumulus transition. And um, this has been kind of the focus of looking at uh, the role of uh, aerosol and drizzle. And um, so I've been doing this as part of my PhD with uh, Ken and Leighton and Lindsay Lee and Jill Johnson. So I'll just run through this summary slide quickly. So as I said, yeah, it's kind of process-based understanding of cloud transitions. Um, I'm using a large eddy simulation model, which is the Monk cloud model. Um, and that's coupled to the Cassim microphysics scheme. Uh, so it's high resolution. So it's 50 meters in the horizontal and down to five meters in the vertical uh, around cloud top. And that's uh, on a domain that's 12 by 12 uh, by three kilometers. So yeah, I'm perturbing six parameters and there's a total of 85 simulations. Uh, five of those parameters are kind of initial conditions uh, to do with the metrology. And one of those is from the microphysics scheme. Uh, the data is uh, sampled at half an hour to two hours and the simulation length is over three days in most cases. Uh, I haven't moved on to emulating it yet, but that will be coming later. Um, so first of all, just talk about what's actually going on in the stratocumulus to cumulus transition. Um, so this is a satellite image from the Northeast Pacific, uh, just off the coast of the United States. And on the right of the image, you can see that the, there's this kind of bright white stratocumulus decks. And as you move over, to the left, um, this breaks up into cumulus fields. And this transition is very poorly represented in models, um, but as you can hopefully see, there's a, a large kind of change in the albedo, the radiative effect of these clouds, um, with the stratocumulus being much more kind of reflective in that area versus the darker ocean that's kind of shown through this, uh, between the cumulus clouds. So this transition is caused by the cloudy air being uh, invected over increasingly higher sea surface temperatures. So starting from those stratocumulus decks uh, on the right, you get this kind of, um, the cloud top kind of rises in the atmosphere and you get these cumulus plumes underneath. And then eventually that stratocumulus cloud dissipates and you're just left with cumulus cloud uh, beneath. So I'm interested in how, the kind of timing of this transition is affected by aerosol and drizzle. Uh, so I'll take you through the PPE design. Um, so first started by just simulating a typical transition. So this is just showing um, two different measures of the liquid water through the cloud. The top layer, uh, top row of this figure is showing kind of top down view. And then the second row is showing a cross section at that green dotted line. So on the left is uh, at the beginning of the simulation. So you can see it's a uniform stratocumulus cloud and it's got a high cloud fraction. So that's just the number of columns that are cloudy or the fraction of columns that are cloudy. Uh, then in the middle, this is from kind of midway through the simulation and you can see the cumulus plumes um, in the bottom plot are kind of rising up into the stratocumulus, but we've still got a high cloud fraction. Uh, and then finally, uh, at the end of the simulation, you're just left with this cumulus cloud on the right plot here. Um, and this cloud fraction has suddenly dropped to around half of what it was initially. So the output that I'm interested in, is just the time taken to go from the stratocumulus cloud at the beginning to um, a much lower cloud fraction and the cumulus cloud at the end. So I've perturbed uh, as I said, six parameters. I just, because five of them are kind of initial conditions, I want to give you an idea of what those actually physically are. So um, they're kind of written here 
for example, but uh, this is showing the initial profiles that I feed into the model. So uh, it's the temperature, the water vapor and aerosol. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's just varying those kind of profiles physically. And then the sixth parameter is, to, is a model parameter and it's to do with the odd conversion rate, which is how readily those cloud droplets form into drizzle droplets. Uh, so this was done, this was um, designed using a Latin hypercube design as well, and there's a total of 85 simulations. So I'll just run through some results from this. Um, so first of all, this is showing the relationship with each of those six parameters with transition time. And we find that the aerosol uh, concentration and the boundary layer moisture both have the strongest relationship with transition time. So in particular, the fastest transitions uh, are occurring at lowest uh, low values of aerosol. But as you get towards the slower transition times, that's when the boundary layer moisture has more of an effect. So then uh, looking at the kind of combined parameter um, effect on this output, this uh, pairwise plot is just showing uh, each each one of these plots is showing a different combination of two of the six parameters. So we can kind of pick out the corners. Uh, this is colored by transition time. So we can pick out the corners with the darker colors to show us, to tell us a bit uh, which parameters are kind of influencing those fastest transition times. So they're all kind of in the lower aerosol concentrations, as you might expect from the previous result. Mm -hmm. But uh, thanks. So we find the fastest transitions are uh, lower aerosol in combination with deep boundary layers, um, high auto conversion rates, and dry temperature inversions as well. Um, then I've split by drizzle amount. So this plot, this top plot is showing the rainwater path time series for um, the simulations that I've been able to use for this. Um, and I've just split it by either high or low rainwater path. And then this uh, bottom plot is showing that cloud fraction time series. Um, and again, colored by high or low rainwater path. And this dotted line shows uh, where that kind of threshold for reaching the cumulus stage um, is reached. So by averaging these two different uh, rain kind of regimes, uh, we find that on average, the higher rainwater path transitions about 10 hours earlier than the lower rainwater path. So then looking at that relationship with transition time, we do find that the fastest transitions have more drizzle. Um, but as you can see from this uh, scatter plot, the drizzle doesn't very strongly determine the time of the transition. Uh, and then finally, uh, the this is just the same plot as the first one I showed, but now colored by the amount of rain uh, or the value of the rainwater path. Um, so we find that the amount of drizzle is more strongly determined by the boundary layer depth and the auto conversion rate rather than the aerosol concentration as uh, we maybe expected at the beginning, uh, which you can just see by those markers kind of being split more to do with these two parameters. Uh, so yeah, so we do find that there's kind of a rain depletion effect at uh, low aerosol in this transition, but it doesn't kind of strongly determine the timing of the, the transition. Um, and yeah, emulation will tell us a bit more about the covariance of these parameters, and I'll do that next. Thanks. Great, thanks Rachel. Uh, we had a question in the chat, uh, nice results. Um, this is from Marcus, um, nice results. Is this, is this the standard <coughs> stratocumulus to cumulus case? Sorry, say that again. <laughs> is this the stratocumulus to cumulus? Is this the Sandu et al. stratocumulus? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the 2011 uh, composite. So it's not uh, any one uh, observation that this is based off. Quite a lot of the observations um, are kind of a very fast example or a very slow example. So I've gone for, uh, as you said, this, this composite case, which is kind of defines roughly a very typical uh, transition in the Northeast Pacific. Yeah. Um, a question from Ben Sanderson. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, this is fun. This is great. Um, yeah. just, uh, so my question is like, so how, 
uh, how much noise is there if you just like a mind, like how much initial condition uh, sensitivity is there? Like how much, how much spread and transition time do you get just from minor perturbations to the initial conditions? Um, so I guess you mean like the kind of model. Um, yeah, what's so, the like, predictability of the system? Like, yeah, I, I've not looked at it specifically for this case, but I have previously kind of varied that in the model for just a, a plain strat stratocumulus case. Um, the I don't really have a number off the top of my head, but it would be quite small compared to the kind of changes we're seeing uh, within the whole PPE here. Yeah, um, yeah like pretty yeah pretty small compared to the the variation that we see across the ensemble it it covers a huge range of behavior actually and so, um, i mean that's evident from your last plots yeah yeah and even showing here the um like these dark gray or the gray spots are ones that didn't form shot cumulus or didn't transition to cumulus by the end of the simulation so there's like a whole lot of other behaviors in there that aren't even really technically a transition yeah yeah Cool. Okay. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, Thank you. Next is um, Greg Alcesa. Ready to share? Hi. Comments? Yes. Hi, Greg. All right. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. Um, yeah. All right, so I'll be uh, so so our overall our goal here with our PPE was um, we wanted to design a PPE that one yielded outputs where each member actually agreed with um, approximately thirty five satellite observational diagnostics, yet each member had different parameter um, combinations. So it was sort of like different processes, but similar mean states. And we were sort of addressing the question, or wanted to address the question on to what extent do similar mean states um, constrain climate projections versus is it really is it really amounting to a lot of uh, differences at, at the sub um, at the process level despite similar mean states and those different processes are conspiring in such a way to give different projections um, or different climate model um, uh, predictions um, and uh, so my Marcus Van Leerwalk he was a is a huge collaborator on this project who led uh, designed the machine learning architecture as well as a uh, uh, the rest of the GIS uh, clouds group. Um, both in uh, coming up with um, experiments and, and human intuition um, for interpreting some of our results. So we're using the um, we're using the GIST E3, which which we just submitted our, our first uh, configuration, which was which was from this framework uh, to ESGF uh, back in July. Um, we're we're sacrificing um, a little bit with uh, horizontal resolution, but we we're pretty high for uh, for vertical resolution. We're, we're perturbing 45 parameters, and again, we're the the end the end result was 200 PPE um, simulations or 200 members um, with uh, with the constraints I, I um, described. Uh, to arrive at those, we have another PPE where, that comprised 450 simulations. We use that to train our emulator to arrive at our 200 in balance and um, close to satellite climatological um, estimates. Um, you know, for those uh, for those 200 members, varying convection and large scale, as well as moist turbulence uh, parameters. And at present, we have monthly output, but we're um, we have a lot of requests to go higher resolution. And then um, we're one year using a prescribed SST climatology, but again, it'll be four years by the end of this year. And uh, our big take big messages I really want to harp on here are we're trying to account for errors in, in satellite observations or, or really biases, not random, and uh, arrive at a way to determine structural deficiencies um, in our model. So um, ideally, we could sample parameters. So you know, not worry about emulation. Not, and we could just do it quickly. We could just randomly sample parameters with with millions of of experiments, run the model, compare to observations. Um, that's very difficult to do because uh, you know due to computer uh, limitations, computing resources. So we train, what we basically do is we uh, perturb our 45 parameters with 450 uh, uh, experiments. We train a surrogate model on that. That becomes uh, a model that then maps out our 45 parameters to actual uh, different satellite metrics. Uh, and you can see here they all are. We have 35 satellite metrics. They span both radiation in the top, water vapor, 
different cloud fields, tropical cyclone count, all kinds of things that we use here um, in diagnostics. And here I'm just showing the success of the emulator in reproducing what the actual GCM output um, is. So we have a workable emulator. And then what we can use, do with that, with that is, okay, we can look at the power um, map showing the connections between all of our, our model parameters as well as our, our outputs. And it's often the case, so you're not gonna be able to, you know, um, uh, understand what each of these uh, acronyms stands for or, or the, the parameter names, but um, but the color, the, the boldness of the color uh, denotes the power that a particular parameter has on an output. So for instance, the critical threshold for, for uh, snow formation, like not related to, um, or a diameter for, uh, for snow in the large scale routine is very impactful on all of our fields. Whereas, you know, a decay time for our shallow cumulus is less impactful on a lot of fields, except for a couple. Right, so it's if you look at enough outputs, you always find one parameter that does have an impact. So it's it's sort of interesting where you know if we didn't look at forty five outputs, maybe thirty, we would say, oh, some parameters aren't important. But we've learned that yeah, at some point the parameters uh, all do do matter for for some select output. It just depends on who's interested in that output. Um, so with with our with our surrogate model, we can then you know now run the model, find all the parameters um, that we want that give us our desired outputs. And ideally, um, we would find one optimal parameter com uh, configuration uh, with with well um, with a, a well observed atmospheric uh, you know diagnostics. But it turns out that that uh, observations are noisy and potentially biased. And so, when you actually account um, for um, observations that that have potentially large biases, and, and we you know I have I don't have time to go into describing how we compute these. You can end up with a lot of diverse parameter configurations that lead to agreement with the observations because you have large observational error, um, and that's that's an interesting takeaway that that I really want to um, to uh, convey to the uh, to the audience. Um, so this is just a summary, a, a, a first summary slide showing well how well is our uh, our our new model that is that uses machine learning to uh, to tune it. How does that compare to different observations? Again, we really have 45. I'm just showing three here in, the, in these top, uh, these left three rows. We'll absorb shortwave radiation, water vapor, and total cloud cover. Uh, the third column from the left is, is from our new, our new model. And this is our old one. Now, some of these improvements in fields are, are not due to just, just our, new, our approach for calibrating the model. We also have structural, uh, clearly structural improvement as well, especially in low clouds. But here's, here's another, the other takeaway. So if we were just to use a, a PPE that was perhaps um, designed by, by random, um, by Latin hy hypercube sampling, we would Six have minutes. this. Uh, thanks. Okay. We would have this right here, which shows a, a lot of disagreement, you know, relative to, you know, top of the atmosphere radiation for shortwave, which will come close to two, 240, you know, watts per meter squared. Whereas the way we're doing this, we're designing PPE members to be in agreement with the top of the atmosphere shortwave radiation, but the emulator has error, so it's not going to be exact. But again, I'm just showing one. I'm showing one variable, but we really have 35. So we're designing this PPE to kind of agree with all of these satellite climatologies, but have different parameter settings, which is kind of uh, allows us to ask some interesting questions. Um, we learned something really interesting. So sometimes this is really fully a parameter problem, where I'm just showing two different fields: long wave on uh, cloud radiation effects on the x-axis, and different uh, total liquid water path and total cloud cover for shallow cumulus cloud. And ignore the colors of the dots, but basically at these crosshairs, this shows kind of where the observation state we should fall. And if we can get a dot on the crosshairs, then we're good. We know it's sort of a parameter problem. We can find configurations that give us um, uh, with our existing structure that allow us to match these observations. And again, you have to you have to imagine this is 35 dimensional space where I'm only showing two. But sometimes we learn this, you know, no matter what we do in the bottom right for um, for parameter combinations from our machine learning. Um, calibration approach, we can never arise at this at the correct stratiform fraction. So we learn that that there's a structural problem in the model. And this stratiform fraction relates to how heavy the rain falls over a grid um, relative to, you know, if you have a grid rainfall, what fraction of it is light to moderate versus heavy. And we learn that we don't have the physics that can reproduce that um, in the crosshairs. And we need to work on that. Um, and that's actually guiding our future uh, CMIP-7 climate model development uh, and I'm, I'm working on, uh, we're working on new physics to, uh, to improve that. So, which we then can apply this method to after at the end of the day. So the takeaway messages, um, the first is we really want to really want to think about the role of observations in calibrating global climate models. There was an interesting paper in 2008 re, uh, written by Peter Gleckler et al. 
Uh, and they ask a really intriguing question on, you know, if observations or if models are proved to the point where their errors are comparable to observational uncertainty, um, we will have to take a more rigorous approach in, in using observations on and, and, and consider error in observations because it might approach, it might be similar to the error in the models. And we might be approaching that point. And I'm just giving a couple teaser images on the, in the right where, where our framework is returning parameter combinations. This is a PDF of parameter combinations for two different parameters. And you look at when we don't use observational bias in our approach, we get this, this PDF to the left. When we do use observational bias in our approach, we get the PDFs to the right. So basically what that says is what we assume for error or uncertainty in observations shapes or crafts the plausible parameter combinations we arrive, we arrive at. And this, could, this is something that's probably not, not unique to our model. Our second one is um, um, a question that I, that I hope I've, I've um, clearly you know, summarized. Um, to what extent does an ideal parameter combination exist for any model? And can we really learn um, uh, where, by, by this framework, um, where, where discrepancies are structural and which are not? And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, I think we had a question from uh, Dave Sexton while you while were talking. Dave? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, it was a really simple question. I just wanted to know whether the diagnostics you were using were like global or regional means or were they root mean square errors of the patterns? Yeah, so, so they were zonal climatologies um, for, each, for each, each thing, except for something like tropical cyclone count, which was, uh, of course, a global, you know, global number. Okay, so they're, they're the zonal, zonal means and then it's a root mean square error of the zonal means. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, a Ruby and square error. Of course, that was the way our framework works because we account for uncertainty um, in the zonal climatology. You have an envelope, right? An envelope, uh, you know, for, you know, designed derived from the observations for that global climatology. So it's not just one number that's that is a function yeah. of latitude. There's a, yeah, there's an uncertainty that varies. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Greg. Thanks. Um, move on. Um, Thanks. So to Claudia De Baldi plans for a large ensemble. Andrew, Andrew has, a, has a question in the chat. Uh, if we have yeah, we, uh, let's pick that up in the etherpad. Okay. Yeah, because we have. All right. Um, okay, somebody shouts if uh, my presentation is not looking right. Um, that looks good. So, <laughs> so as the title um, implies, this is really um, looking forward to um, work that uh, hopefully we will be doing in the next year or so. So it's more about plans and about the results, except I have some results at the end when I come to talk about auto-tuning. I'm representing the DOE E3SM team. Of course, all mistakes are mine. Uh, and I would like to thank Ben Joagma, which I think who I think is um, uh, connected, uh, who uh, gave me some uh, slides about the auto-tuning work that he's in charge of. So um, summary slide, the purpose of our perturb parameter ensemble is to explore both parametric scenario and um, initial condition uncertainty jointly. We're going to do this with our ESM, uh, E3SM version three, uh, which will be finalized in the next few months. Uh, the resolution of the model for this application will be uh, about 100 kilom kilometers in the horizontal domain, 72 vertical levels. And uh, we are going to come up, uh, hopefully, with three versions of the model, one the standard version, and then two that explore uh, either a significantly lower or a significantly higher value of climate sensitivity. We are going to uh, run between 20 and 25 initial condition members for each of these versions, and then uh, two scenarios. And um, of course, as everybody can guess, we expect the most important parameters that will have to be um, modified for this three version will have to do with clouds. Um, and as I said, auto-tuning will be employed and I'll talk about it uh, later. So the data frequency, of course, it's anything that you usually save um, from a ESM run. Um, simulation length will have a control, historical, and 21st century. We are also hoping to extend to the 22nd century with a decline uh, from uh, the level of SSP 370. 
um, which is going to be the main scenario for this three version. And we are planning to run a version of one SSP one 2.6 with a standard version. Um, and uh, so let me let me get to the actual presentation because more or less what I told you is what I have in the next slide. So we don't have to go in very many details more, but the idea is that we are going to split about a hundred members of, uh, of initial condition um, um, to uh, between these four ensembles. And um, the reason we feel good about having about 25 members for each of the type of the simulation um, is because we explored uh, that uh, question, a paper that you can find on, in Earth System Dynamics, where we found that for many metrics, particularly of extremes, uh, for this type of model simulation and, and output, uh, 25 members seem to be a uh, good enough uh, size to characterize um, you know, internal variability. So uh, a little more in details, even if I already told you this, um, we are going to um, use auto-tuning for an optimal set of parameters, of course, also in conjunction with some expert manual tuning to come up with a standard version of this model and then uh, based on the result of the auto tuning that will give us some uh, probabilistic uh, representation of the parameter space we hope to find two more combinations of parameters that will produce um, you know a lower and a higher climate sensitivity with respect to the standard version uh, and still mm, produce sensible historical uh, metrics simulations and for this three type of um, you know, model, we are going to uh, run uh, the um, scenario SSP3 7.0 and possibly this uh, extension with a decline uh, after 2100. And then with the standard version of the model, we are going to run something like SSP1 2.6 with you know, some milder overshoot possibly. And the idea is that we expect climate sensitivity to be more relevant for a higher forcing scenario than the lower one. Um, so the goals, as you can imagine, is to uh, try and figure out the effects of climate sensitivity on internal variability, on reversibility, um, explore scenario uncertainty, and um, possibly uh, the effects of the overshoot as dependent on the peak warming and timing. Um, so just a slide to show you that we have some experience uh, with a model that um, changes climate sensitivity. Version one of the E3SM model had a very high climate sensitivity, 5.3 Kelvin. Um, the uh, this, uh, second version um, had a significantly lower climate sensitivity of four. And uh, you see here a uh, plus that you find in a paper by Chris Golas that co-authors in James and shows you, you know, the um, Gregory plots and uh, the actual behavior of these um, idealized uh, simulations, in particular the four times CO2 that was used to diagnose climate sensitivity. And uh, for uh, to go from one to the other, uh, it was found that, you know, mostly um, it was a matter of reducing cloud feedback, Six particularly minutes. in the marine low cloud regions. And you see the, uh, the uh, uh, parameters that were found to be, uh, to create the most sensitivity in the model. Okay, so for auto-tuning in this couple of minutes that are left, um, uh, the idea is that, of course, uh, it, it's going to be used to expedite uh, the, the optimization of the model in its main version, but also we will exploit, um, you know, what, what the probabilistic analysis tells us to choose uh, these other uh, two configurations. And the idea is to run about a hundred uh, simulations with the, with the model. Um, each of them, uh, this is the atmospheric model uh, with the prescribed SSPs, five to 10 years of length, create a surrogate model uh, by sampling parameters for this uh, more simplified version, and then uh, build a cost function based on observational fields um, and uh, uh, determine you know, the most likely parameters. And this is, some, this is a slide of result from a prototype problem that um, was um, developed 
And uh, you see here, um, in this case, 250 simulations, 10 years of length were run uh, with um, five uncertain atmospheric parameters. You see the results here in the probabilistic um, plots um, of the various combination of parameters. You see here in the rotating uh, plot, um, the surrogate surface that was created, estimated on the basis of the uh, sampled results from the model that are the green dots and is used to find, you know, combination of parameters that minimize the cost function. And uh, the software that was used also develops a nice interactive visualization where you can slide uh, parameter values along these uh, uh, dials and see uh, the result in terms of the fields that are create, created as a result. Of course, there is a work to be done to um, make this better um, in terms of you know estimating a better surrogate model, but also um, constructing a cost function that accounts for dependencies in the fields used uh, to diagnose uh, the model performance and also uh, include a systematic bias for the model that right now is not accounted for. Um, so uh, you'll see here some reference if, if you're interested. I think uh, Benj is actually in the audience already to take questions um, if I cannot answer them and I'll conclude here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, there's a question from David Sexton. Hi, Claudia. Hi, hi. Um, nice lovely to see. You. So, were these are these fully coupled runs, or are they atmosphere only? Because I just the, know from my experience. The, for the surrogate is uh, is um, for this work in the auto tuning is just atmospheric model, I believe. Yes. So, do yeah, you know that when, if you if you couple these to an ocean, do you know if you're going to get any surprises like we did? We lost half of our couple PPE, uh, like things that, like AMOC so, drift and... Hmm. Yeah, I, I imagine this was a question that was uh, asked uh, when when this uh, method was uh, developed, but I don't know the answer. I don't know. If, uh, oh, I see Bench that is, <laughs> that is there. Yeah, we expect surprises, but... Uh, right. uh, yeah, so, and th this, this is... Uh, to answer your first question, it's um, prescribed sea surface temperature uh, at um, present day sea surface. So there's not even historically varying sea surface. So so we expect surprises when we couple it or when we run historical simulations that it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the best model from here won't necessarily be the best model uh, in, in those other configurations. Cool, okay. As long as you're expecting it, that's good, yeah. Thanks. Then yeah, if you if you if you ask us in a year and a half, we will tell you how we we dealt with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll have another yeah. meeting in a year and a year and a half. Oh wait, great. <laughs> great. Okay, thanks, thanks, ben. thanks a lot, Claudia. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I have to stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Leighton Regari is our final speaker before the break. Leighton. So everyone. Um, if you're not already there, the etherpad's pretty lively, especially if you've just given a talk. Go ahead, Lane. Thanks, Ken. So we're looking here at uh, identifying structural inconsistencies and their effect on aerosol radiative forcing. Large collaboration of people. We've been uh, creating and analyzing this PP for well over a year. Uh, the main purpose of this PPE is to quantify and constrain the uncertainty in aerosol forcing. This is, uh, I think, around the fourth PP we've created with uh, consecutive versions of the GLOMAP component of the UK ESM aerosol model. So we're looking here at 37 uh, aerosol emission and process parameters, as well as some cloud and radiation parameters. So it's very much a process-driven understanding we're aiming to get on the causes of uncertainty in aerosol forcing. Uh, only 221 members, so that goes back to the first discussion on the etherpad today. We've found that we can get away with a very small ratio of um, model runs compared to parameters being perturbed with this particular interest in aerosol forcing uncertainty. Um, our, our methodology is to come up with as large a number of model variants as possible. So we've created this PPE in two phases uh, using the history matching approach. 
But uh, the first phase ruled out very few parts of parameter space, essentially just some corners of our high dimensional parameter space. And uh, on the left there, it shows that in order to comprehensively sample our uh, model variants, we come up with a million model variants that sample that parameter space. And then we rule those out by comparing to measurements. It's just a basic history matching approach. And ideally we'll get a greatly reduced aerosol forcing uncertainty, which obviously that complexity increases with the number of measurements that we compare to. And that's what I'm looking at today. So firstly, do we sample the uncertainty in our model? Uh, these are the ranges of aerosol forcing we get. And you can see that there's some very wide range of values that we get from around minus three up to two and a half watts per meter squared positive. So we expect some of those values to be ruled out. We're pretty confident that we've sampled the model's pot uh, potential, its wide range of behavior. Um, we can evaluate the causes of model uncertainty. We haven't done a robust sensitivity analysis here. All we've done is look at uh, which model processes are causing the uncertainty using uh, partial correlations, which are essentially just uh, covariance matrices of residuals based on linear regressions. And we've calculated the relative importance of those different terms. And when we think about which measurements we might use as constraints, what we could use as constraint variables, you can see from the figures on the right, one of those, this is the global mean cloud drop concentration. This is cloud fraction. One of these, the cloud drop number concentration has a lot of parameters that are or colors that are similar to the aerosol forcing, the term on the left here. So there's a big overlap, which suggests that this could be used as a constraint. And there's a little bit of overlap with the cloud fraction, but it's not guaranteed that those constraint variables will share sensitivities. So what I mean by that is this is a figure adapted from uh, a paper that Lindsay Lee and Ken wrote some years ago. Um, there's an example here with uh, two different parameters. There's a model output variable and there's aerosol forcing, the thing we're trying to constrain. And if they have different sensitivities to those two parameters, then it doesn't matter how tight a constraint you get on this particular variable. If the sensitivities, which are represented by the contours, are different, then the forcing may not be constrained or the variable that you're trying to constrain may not be constrained. So it's important as well that they share sensitivities. And we didn't spend time analyzing that in detail, but we knew it would be a factor. So we included all of the different potential constraint variables, which include over stratocumulus regions, predominantly stratocumulus regions, five of those. We took these six different measurements. So on the top left, there's shortwave radiative fluxes, and then on the right, cloud drop number concentration, we've got cloud fraction, liquid water path, cloud optical depth, and effective radius. And this figure shows two different constraints to two individual variables that are represented by these arrows. So we've just taken, this is November cloud drop concentration. And when we were constrained to that, that's the section that's in green on some of these plots and purple where there's an overlap. All the other months are constrained really nicely towards the measurements, which are in uh, green diamonds here. So if we constrain for just one month, we can constrain cloud drop concentration for all those months. So essentially that's saying there's a lot of redundancy in the measurements that we're collecting. One, one of those will do a great job in terms of constraining the model behavior. And similarly, they'll constrain just from that one month, the radiative fluxes and the cloud fraction really well across a number of months. But there's some other things that stand out like for uh, cloud optical depth, when we constrain to the cloud drop concentration, none of our model variants in that constraint set overlap with the measurements at all. So we've essentially reduced the model skill through this constraint. We've reduced the model skill at simulating cloud optical depth. And similarly, the constraint for liquid water path, which is shown in pink, doesn't do a very good job at simulating cloud, uh, cloud fraction nor shortwave radiative fluxes. So this is giving us an indication that there's some sort of internal um, model discrepancy, some sort of uh, inconsistency in how these things are represented. And we've gone ahead an, an extra step and evaluated each of those constraint variables against every other potential uh, variable. So on the y-axis here are the variables that we've used for constraint. And on the x-axis is the variable that's been constrained. So each one of those squares is a comparison between our 1 million member um, normalized root mean squared errors on average, and the constrained set of normalized root mean squared area errors, constrained to the variable on the y-axis. And what stands out here is this purple section on the right, 
the pinky purple section, which is indicating that there's a decrease in model skill for those variables on the x axis. And this Excellent. is telling us, thanks Ken, that there's some inconsistency between this set of variables, the hemispheric difference in cloud drop concentration, some transects from stratocumulus to cumulus, and these that we've measured over a number of different months. There's some inconsistency between how they're represented and these three down here, effective radius liquid water path and cloud optical depth. So we've highlighted this discrepancy, this internal model inconsistency. And if we included all of those measurements, then we'd effectively end up with a very weak constraint. So our approach from there is to only include a subset of the possible constraint variables that we know are represented with some internal consistency. And that allows us to get a really tight constraint on the aerosol radiative forcing. And we've chosen measurements that are targeting the aerosol cloud interaction component of that forcing. So there's no surprise this aerosol radiation component isn't constrained here. But these dots in yellow show that we only need around 13 of our constraint variables in combination to get an optimal constraint using this structurally and inconsistent model. And our proposition is that we could get a much tighter constraint represented by the purple on the blue lines if we are able to overcome these structural inadequacies, because that would allow us to use even more measurements in our constraint. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Leighton. Uh, yeah, you can leave that up for people to read. Um, yeah, are there any uh, questions? I see one. Sorry, I'm a bit slow getting to my. Hey, Leighton, this is Marcus. Go on, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it sounds like basically the approach is to. Um, Nix obs that um, that the model doesn't have sort of the physics to represent something like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, so one of the you know, it, is there some possibility of of just inflating the errors in some of these obs? Like would that would that yield a similar benefit? Are they just like completely poisonous to the whole process, or is there some information content that can be pulled out if you kind of reduce you know just have their constraint be a little bit gentler in the the problem? Yeah, I mean that's. Really important, Marcus. There's two parts there. I think the, the people who've come up with these aspects of the, the model would say that they are representing those physical processes. They're probably just not doing it as well as we hope or not with the consistency that maybe has been overlooked until now. Uh, and in terms of inflating the uncertainty, um, maybe I didn't dwell on it long enough, but there were some regions there where those uh, measurements were right on the edge of our model's perturbed parameter range. So pretty difficult for the model to be able to capture that behavior as it's been observed. And of course, we could really inflate the observational uncertainty, but then we're going to be capturing perturbed parameter members that are right on the fringe, the extreme of our combined parameter ranges. So I'm not sure how much I'd trust those anyway, or that constraint. Sort of what Greg was pointing out with his uh, 2D PDFs, when that observational uncertainty has been included. Something we should come back to in discussion, I think. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions for Leighton, then I think we can wrap up this first session. Um, we're only five minutes late. It's quite hard when we have eight minute presentations to keep it on time, but we're, we're five minutes late, so it's not too bad. Maybe we can have a, um, a full 20 minute break and come back at um, 25 past whatever hour you're on. <laughs> Um, and just a reminder, could you put your name on Etherpad when you chip in, even if your color has been defined at some point, just makes it easier for everyone to see who they're talking to. Um, okay, so we will be, some of us will be in Wonder Me shortly. Um, go and get yourself a cup of tea or whatever it is, time of day. Um, we'll, we'll see you there. And we'll Hard to tell if we have everyone back from our Wonder Me session. <laughs> but, uh... I'm going to assume <laughs> that we do. Some people lost in wonder me. <laughs> do I have to go. I mean, it's like in a real physical meeting. Do I have to go to the lobby and see if there's some people hanging around out there? Exactly. Ask for the this, this is Alice's adventures. Adventures in Wonder Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, for those people that are here, we have yet another a very varied session, and that's uh, done intentionally so that we have plenty to discuss in our afternoon sessions. So we have uh, a, a number of global modeling. Uh, perturbed parameter ensemble pieces of research. 
we also have some LEM work and it's not just all about uh, identifying the important parameters that cause uncertainty in the models there's also some model simplification work and some identification of structural errors again so some themes coming out but to begin for this session uh, that Andrew Gettleman is going to present for us and I'm going to stick to the six minute verbal warning over to you Andrew uh thank you hang on actual telephone is ringing hang that up um so what i'm going to talk about i'm actually going to skip the first slide because it's all going to be contained in the slides that i've got and this is a perturbed parameter ensemble that we've been doing with um the community atmosphere model and it's a wide cast of characters so we've had a bunch of people at ncar that have um helping out with this as well as using emulators um, from Duncan Watson Paris at the University of Oxford, and also help uh, from Marcus and Greg, and then Daniel McCoy and Sai Song at the University of Wyoming have been extending this. And one of the things about our, our PPE is it's actually extensible because it's a community model. So motivation is to understand, similar to others, is to understand the sensitivity of different parameters. And we're also looking at both um, climate sensitivity or and feedbacks as well as climate forcing and potentially to use this eventually as uh, selecting parameter values for tuning a model. Um, the initial goal is basically looking at mean state climate, aerosol forcing, and cloud feedbacks. So we've actually selected, this is 45 parameters, and we've ended up with 263 parameter sets for our simulations across most of the moist physics and aerosols. Um, we're using a Latin hypercube, and the way we're doing this is a global model, fixed SSTs, three-year simulations. We tested with five years, but haven't had much difference. There wasn't much statistical difference in our emulator performance between three and five years when we came and did this. So um, we're doing three types of simulations. So we've done close to, we have done close to 800 simulations. There have been extensions to this with other um, shorter simulations as well that I'll mention here. Um, we've done present day runs. We've done pre-industrial runs, which are the same thing same SSTs, but with pre-industrial aerosol loading and to look at aerosol forcing. And then we've done uh, SST 4K plus 4K uniform increase in sea surface temperatures, basically to look at feedbacks in the system, fast feedbacks in the atmosphere. They're all done with the same parameter sets. And we've actually got Python scripts that'll take our community model and are designed to read in parameter sets that you generate from a Jupyter notebook that we have that does a lot in hypercube sampling and actually take those parameter sets from a file and then just fire off the simulations on a given supercomputing system. So um, this is actually very extensible because you can change that script to configure the model any way you want. So collaborators at the University of Wyoming have run nudged experiments one year with the same parameters. So they've hauled off and just done 263 runs with nudging for one year and, and played with some of the aerosols. Um, you can run the single column model. We've also done that with the same parameters. So there's all kinds of extensibility options um, that can be used with our model. So we, we're doing um, some daily averages, mostly two-dimensional and mean monthly uh, outputs of a huge array of climate variables, most of them um, on the two-dimensional side. Um, just to look at the spread. So this is just a couple of clouds showing uh, the liquid water path here. The solid line is the mean. Interestingly, the dash line is the default model, which is not anywhere near the, marine, the mean of the uh, PPE. And you can see the long wave is actually pretty well constrained. Uh, the liquid water path is all over the place. Um, this is a standard deviation. We don't actually have negative liquid water. It's just what the standard deviation shows. And you can see we get a huge range in the net solar flux at the top of the model. Um, as we were talking about, there are a wide range of uh, runs Interestingly enough, most of them are, the model tends to run a little bit positive. Um, and even for the default parameter sets in the present day, we tend to be um, actually, um, you can see it's right here, it's, it's a little bit positive. So we tend to skew that way in the top of the atmosphere flux and just variations in cloud drop number as well. So we get quite a big spread with the PPE. We haven't done any selection of these to be realistic. So there's quite a wide range of things going on. And then this is the spread and actually the differences in those ensemble sets. So similar things, but looking at, for example, the shortwave cloud radiative forcing. So this uh, the, this is the SST 4K that pretty much is giving you a measure of the cloud of the feedbacks. And then this is giving you a measure of the aerosol forcing. You can see we're about minus 1.8 in our um, aerosol forcing pre uh, 
present day minus pre-industrial. And you can look at the range of, for example, the net solar flux in those experiments as well. So here it pretty much decreases, but this is about what we come up with for the aerosol forcing. So lots of things going on, um, big spread that can be explored. And that's, so for example, Margaret Duffy has actually then calculated a kernel adjusted feedback from all these uh, PPE experiments. This is the uh, total feedback parameter, the cloud feedback broken into the short wave and the long wave. And what's interesting is she's actually compared this to the same calculation from the CMIP6 ensemble. And we have about the same spread as the entire ensemble in our, um, in our total feedback, radiative feedbacks in the atmosphere. So we actually think this can be used for um, quite a number of purposes as a controlled experiment to kind of probe what's going on. Um, and Margaret's diving into this. Um, she's got a paper in preparation on um, the feedbacks in this, which is in the PPE, which is kind of interesting. We've also been using emulators. So this is from Trude Eidehammer, and this is the uh, Gaussian process emulator from the University of Oxford, where we're actually trying to emulate the two-dimensional field of the long wave cloud forcing. So we can basically train it on a bunch of samples, give it another parameter set that it hasn't seen before and see, can it actually reproduce the pattern? Um, and actually, so this is the RMS at difference in it doing that. And this is sort of a fit to that. It actually can do a pretty good job of reproducing the, the actual pattern of some of these output fields um, for um, arbitrary parameter sets. So when we actually use build the emulator. So this, we're getting towards being able to do uh, model tuning and things and actually working on this regionally, trying to optimize uh, different climate regimes that we're interested in. Six minutes. And then this is, sure, almost done. Um, this is then using a couple of different emulators. So using the climate bench emulator from uh, Duncan with a neural network, a Gaussian process and a random forest. Those are the three middle columns. The test data is on the left with 238 samples. And these are the probability distribution functions of global mean values of the long wave cloud forcing, the top of the model residual TOA balance and the short wave cloud forcing. So this is just sort of general radiative balance in a climate model. And then this is the test data and the different climate bench emulation emulation options. And then this is the neural network that Greg was talking about. Um, and you can see, we can actually reproduce the PDF. This is 238 samples. And then we've created another 5,000 samples to kind of fill out that parameter space when we do this. Um, the climate bench neural network isn't quite working that well, but the others are actually doing a pretty good job of reproducing these PDFs. Um, and the line is actually the default. I, I can't remember if that's the default or if that's the mean, I think it's actually the D, it's the default configuration, I think. Um, so that's a bunch of the different things we're doing. So as a summary, um, this is a good way to probe the sensitivity of the physics. We seem to do pretty well with uh, 40 some odd different parameters and 263 on uh, parameter sets. Um, there's a large spread in results. We're working with a couple of different emulators and a couple of different options. Um, all this data is available, there's a DOI for it. Um, I can happy put that in the chat and share it with people. Um, we're writing a paper on this, so it's going to be documented in a publication, but it's already got a DOI. The scripts for running this are also available, and it's extensible, as I said. And the last thing is this is part of a multi-model PPE project that I'm leading, um, funded by NASA, to look at a cross-model PPE of clouds and aerosols. And we're using our model and the model that Greg talked about from uh, GIS and also the NASA GEOS model. What's unique is that we're looking at clouds and aerosols and all three models feature the same cloud microphysics scheme in slightly different versions with aerosol interaction. So we can actually perturb the same parameters and see how they behave in different models, which is kind of interesting. And we're also exploring the emulation in different models and even looking at that across models. So as you've seen, uh, GIS and NCAR both have our first PPEs done and we're looking at running the same emulators on these and starting to think about comparing them and comparing sort of the importance maps and the relative importance of the different parameters. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, Trudy, Trudy so, notes that just on this plot, the line actually is observations. So sorry, I didn't get that right, but thanks, Trudy. Yeah, so I mean, questions in the chat as with the last session. I think that's an interesting point, Andrew, that if that's the observations from Ceres, then there may be uh, some variables that you're not able to capture or don't reliably capture with the majority of your model variants there. Oh yeah, and you can see we're pretty screw we're pretty skewed in the uh, top of model residual here, um, just in, in these samples, it skews positive um, by a few watts per meter squared. That's just 
the way the model tends to run when we run it with fixed SSTs for present day. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have an idea of how to push it to cover those measurements further. Um, oh yeah, we can push it back. But again, it's the, the set of, um, if you do that, then you start to break other things, right? Sure. It's the classic case that you were showing Leighton where you can't meet, you can't really match all the observations uh, with most of these models due to the structural uncertainty. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not watching the etherpad, so I'm not sure how much has gone on there. I'm sure there's plenty for you to comment on, Andrew. Uh, we're going to move on to Yao Sheng. If you want to share your screen for us, Yao Sheng, I hear you've got that working. Uh, so let's start. Uh, this is Yao Sheng Chen. Uh, I came from Grand Fungos Group. Uh, today, I'm pre I'm going to present some recent works in our group using a larger uh, PPE related approach. So the idea is that we believe that to better understand the cloud radi straight equipment's cloud radiative effects and aerosol cloud interactions, we need to go beyond individual cases and take a look at the uh, straight equipment's population across a very wide range of conditions. So what we do is we perturb the, uh, a few variables defining initial profiles of temperature, moisture, and aerosol, and then send them into areas. So exactly what we do is we perturb uh, the initial mixed layer depth and use two parameters that is the boundary layer value and the jump to quantify the, uh, to specify the moisture initial sounding and also the te temperature initial sounding and then uh, aerosol sounding. And from the areas we we are most interested in a parameter called, uh, in a variable called relative cloud radiative effect, RCRE, which is approximately the product between cloud albedo, AC, and cloud fraction. And we're also, we also examine the code path uh, to characterize the uh, macrophysics of the clouds in the simulation and also the N, which is cloud drop number concentration and characterizes the microphysics. So to get a first impression of the clouds in our uh, example to the left is the, uh, can, is the trajectory of all the simulations in this liquid path and N plane. We can easily identify three regimes to the upper left corner it's a regime dominated by precipitation and precipitation induced cloud break, breakup to the upper right corner. The clouds here usually start with pretty uh, thick uh, cloud layer and then thins over time. And for other regions, uh, cloud usually starts with broken uh, cloud field and not much liquid path, but then deepens and broadens over time. But what is interesting is to the right, we can see the RCRE is actually a function of liquid path and, and only, I mean, even though we perturb six parameters to, to generate this ensemble, it seems that it, it can be represented pretty nicely in this simplified to, uh, 2D space. So to, to take a look at this first, we uh, used uh, Gaussian process emulation to emulate this uh, RCRE surface as, as well as the AC and car fraction surface as function of liquid path and M. What we found is that for the non-precipitating part, the RCRE follows the, uh, is quite proportional to this line uh, determined by liquid path uh, raised to five, five six and, and, and uh, raised to one third. Uh, this is because the cloud albedo for, for this part uh, quite closely follow this creation, uh, which agrees well with uh, Burr's and Michelle's work uh, quite a long time ago. And we found that in this area, actually the cloud fraction is not sensitive to the uh, to the number concentration, and it only depends on liquid path. So the product of them RCRE is behave like this. For this non precipitating part, emulator nicely captures the shift in the sensitivity. Now, since the RCRE depends on liquid path, and, and we then it matters. Uh, it's important to know uh, within this 2D plane where do those simulations then spend most of the time. So let's take a look at how the liquid path and end states move in this plane. So what we found, uh, what we do here is um, to the left, you, you can see that every, is the plot I showed you uh, previously, every simulation start with this magenta dot and move towards this green dot. So if we emulate the velocity components, uh, the velocity for liquid path and liquid velocity for N, uh, then uh, both, uh, both defined as the d log dt, then we can make a, a use the quiver plot on the right-hand side to represent the velocity field. And we can see that there's a clearly a band with very, uh, along this blue line with shading with near zero velocity. And, and as simulations move towards this line, velocity reduces, that indicates a steady state band along this blue line. 
So to explain this behavior, we use mixed layer, layer theory. We, we know that based on that theory, the liquid path tendency of the simulation is controlled by the force and coming, coming from a few processes. So without getting into all the, so what we get is, all we did is we diagnose all these tendencies and then emulate them again as function of liquid path and without getting into too much details, I just want to see that for this non-precipitating part is the balance between these uh, radiative cooling uh, surface fluxes, uh, both of which always give you positive uh, liquid path tendency uh, and the entrainment, which give you the negative tendency. So we can see that the, uh, there's a dependence of liquid path to N. So what happened mostly in our setup simulation is that the high number concentration enhances uh, entrainment, as we can see in these three panels on the bottom. Uh, if N is low, like on the left, for 50 per cc, uh, 50 per cc then the, the, from, from all the way to 200 per cc, what changed most is that the entrainment changed a lot. So basically, the, this response in entrainment uh, due to evapor evaporative cooling and other mechanisms is uh, driving the location of this steady state liquid path. So to understand the, okay, to understand this liquid path adjustment to N for this whole power population, what it is, we consider, we diagnosed its D log liquid path to N for the, all cases. And if we take all the dots at the beginning, the slope uh, or the, the, this ratio is pretty neutral as shown in the magenta line in the middle panel. And as we move towards the later of the simulation, uh, it gets more negative. And eventually we know that you will get to a very negative uh, value uh, determined by this steady state line. And from here, we can estimate a time scale of this evolution of about 20 hours. So I'll skip this slide. Mm, just to summarize, we use perturbed parameters to generate or yes, ensemble and use Gaussian process emulation to analyze the data. So far, this exercise has been pro very prolific. For ongoing work, we are focusing on new simulations uh, with interactive surface fluxes and dyno cycle. And also specifically, we are examining the cloud fraction adjustment to M. So I'll stop here and take questions. Thanks, Yaosheng. Uh, David has his question up. Go ahead, David. Ooh. Hi, um, that's really nice talk. Thanks. Um, I'm not super familiar with all these large data simulations, but presumably the aim, what I'm, it'd be good to understand the end game of this because presumably you're trying to find out about the detailed physics by perturbing the large data simulator. And then is the plan then to try and include that in parameterizations or that information that you get in parameterizations that can be then put into models? Mm, we haven't thought about how to use I mean, use, for example, we learn from this mission to improve large scale models. So far, it's pretty about uh, using LES to understand the behavior of this crowd population themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting about be interesting, we yeah. those time scales like this, how to inform climbing model with that. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Haven't thought about that. Cool. I don't see any other questions there. So thanks, Xiaosheng. We'll move on to our next speaker, which is Ulrika Prost. Ulrika, you can yeah. share your screen when you're ready. Welcome. Yeah, when, yes. <laughs> when we're to unshare. Exactly. So is this working? It's great. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks very much for uh, having me have a talk at this workshop. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I'm presenting part of my PhD work um, with Sylvain and Ulrike Lohmann um, on characterizing the cloud microphysics scheme of our aerosol climate model, which is ecam -HAM in this case, um, and also looking for how we can simplify this. Um, and so the summary slide is here. So as I said, we're using ecam -HAM, um, as the global model, um, and we're using 14 parameters that we're perturbing. And the type of parameters that we perturb, which I think is quite different from what people have said before, is um, the process efficiency of the cloud microphysical processes. Um, and then, yeah, we're also using emulation and variance-based sensitivity analysis. And then in the end, also looking for simplification potential. So I think that's also uh, 
quite special here. And the motivation, therefore, deviates, I think, a bit from um, yeah, not only looking at uncertainty, but really um, the fact that our climate models are quite complex, mainly because the Earth system is complex. So then uh, the natural thing to do when you want to represent this is to add more and more detail to the model. But then the model at some point becomes so complex that you also have difficulty to interpret it. Um, and that's where yeah, the science comes in on the one hand to characterize the scheme, but also to look for how we can maybe simplify it. And as I said, I'm looking at the cloud microphysics. So the two moment cloud microphysics scheme includes um, cloud droplets, liquid rain droplets, ice crystals, snowflakes, and then water vapor, and then different processes that connect all the different classes. So for example, heterogeneous freezing would move uh, cloud droplets to ice crystals. But then we have so many processes and many of those are nonlinear and therefore somewhat chaotic that it really becomes difficult to interpret what any one change would do to the model or any output variable that we're interested in. Um, hence, we do a sensitivity study or a <laughs> extended one with the PPE. Um, but I'm introducing um, new parameters that I want to perturb. So for each process, I introduce this uh, efficiency parameter, which is here called ETA. Um, and so, for example, for ice crystal accretion, which is an ice crystal and a snowflake sticking together to form a snowflake, um, this would be influencing the ice crystal number concentration. And so I perturb this effectiveness between half as effective and double as effective. And then, of course, since we're in a PPE, I do this uh, quite a few times, in this case, 100. And then I'm perturbing all other processes or their efficiencies with the same range and all at the same time. So this is also done using Latin hypercube sampling. Um, and then it's an extension to earlier work where we just had four processes. So now it's really the whole scheme. Um, and then we've seen this before <laughs> in different presentations. So in our case, it's uh, one variable of interest would be the global annual mean ice water path. And then we see on the X and Y axis, the 14 different processes that we're looking at and how the ice water path responds to perturbations in these processes. And then what you want to look at is which uh, process gives the most order to this ice water path result. And I highlighted that here. So it's this uh, little square on the top where ice crystal order conversion really has the most influence and ice crystal accretion secondary influence. Um, and so apart from just looking at these plots, we can also quantify this for that we emulate uh, what this response surface looks like and sample more samples than the 100 we actually ran from it. Um, and then the sensitivity analysis confirms what we already saw visually. So ice crystal order conversion is the most important parameter for ice water path in this case. But then the cool part is we can put this all together, uh, summarizing basically for all 14 processes on the x-axis, how they influence global annual mean variables on the y-axis. Um, and so again, ice crystal order conversion shows up as uh, negatively influencing ice water path. So the more ice crystal order conversion I have, the less ice water path I get. Um, and I guess this is somehow similar to the power, I think you called it power analysis uh, that was mentioned before. But yeah, just for our processes. So for example, ice crystal number concentration, you can see is also influenced by the Wigner background Quint Eisen process and so on. Um, and then we also had the idea to compare this to our physical understanding. So for this, I'm adding here in S circles, the points where I would just looking at the scheme, I would expect to see an influence. Um, and so for example, for secondary ice production, which just um, creates two ice crystals out of one, I would have expected that this leads to an increase in ice crystal number concentration. However, we don't see this effect. So there are a lot of processes where we would expect some uh, sensitivities of the models, but we don't see them. And this is very likely because other processes are masking it. So in this case, ice crystal auto conversion is really a dominant process that makes many other processes uh, appear unimportant, or at least in comparison. Um, but on the other hand, we also have some processes where uh, sensitivities pop up where we wouldn't expect them to. So for example, the wegener bergman wind eisen process, you'd think doesn't influence number concentration because it only transfers mass from liquid to ice. However, here our thinking is that these are the adjustment processes that happen in the model. So while the wegener bergman fint eisen process is transferring mass, it's making uh, the ice crystals or snowflake sediment faster and thus decreasing ice crystal number concentration overall. 
So there we already get a good gain in understanding and possibly also information, for example, for tuning or improving the model. Six minutes. Um, and then the other thing I would like to highlight is that there are some processes in here which don't seem to have an effect, which I already said could be masked by other dominant processes, but we wanted to investigate this further, so we tried out some simplifications for these. So for example, we saw heterogeneous freezing and secondary ice production doesn't influence any of the processes, any of the variables, sorry, that we looked at. Um, so then we tried what happens when you just leave them away, so you remove their effect. Um, and then in present day, this is five year simulations for present day, we see that actually we don't get much of a deviation in terms of interannual variability of the default for these variables and others that are not shown. Um, but then, for example, for sublimation of ice and for self collection, when I set these to constant, I do get some variation in ice water path. And similarly, for rhyming, I get a deviation in liquid water path. Um, and this is partly explained by this masking effect. So, actually, when we zoom in on the processes uh, that are insensitive, that the um, sensitivity analysis doesn't or shows as unimportant, and I leave out the others, then actually rhyming, for example, shows up as influencing liquid water path. So this result is very much determined by um, how, which processes I'm including in the analysis. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we've done the sensitivity analysis on this emulated PPE of cloud microphysical processes. On the one hand, this just helps us to characterize um, and understand the model and, for example, would help with tuning, but also comparing to physical understanding, we can highlight model deficiencies. And then we also find some processes that can sim that the analysis points out that can be simplified. And also when I try this in pre-industrial simulations or in future simulations, these uh, simplifications also hold. Um, and then, of course, how you interpret this depends on what vision you have for what a climate model should be able to do. So some people might say, ah, these processes we can remove and make the model simpler. But uh, you could also say, where well, this points to model deficiencies, these are the, the important processes are the ones where we really need to pool resources to improve them. And I'm yeah, looking forward to the discussion on what you think about it. Thanks. Thanks, Ulrika. Uh, there aren't any questions in the chat yet. Um, I'm wondering about that idea of if you're able to suggest something can be simplified, um, <laughs> how can you be confident that you've evaluated all the potential uh, variables of interest and that some one with some bespoke use of the model yeah. doesn't rely on a perturbation that, or a parameter or process that you've uh, simplified? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, in some way, you could say you can never be sure, right? I mean, I repeatedly have this, especially for heterogeneous freezing, because people are very keen on this process, I think. Um, so then people always say, well, but what about a seasonal analysis or a regional analysis or this variable or this one? And of course, you can always come up with something that I haven't tested. Um, but so for the previous analysis with just the four processes, we also did this, did the regional and seasonal analysis, and it wasn't any different from the global one. And I think with the variables I look at, some of them being quite close to the clouds um, and some being sort of further removed along the chain of how a process would interact, I believe I capture much of the signal. And then you also have to think about what you want the model to be adequate for. So what actually is your purpose? And then if you can simulate the variables you're interested in, fine. And the model is in that sense actually final then that might be good enough, right? But that's exactly why I try also in pre-industrial and future scenarios. Yeah, very cool. Uh, ben had the same question, so we covered <laughs> that back. So good, and there's plenty going on in the etherpad for you to look at. Thank you. You can present when you're ready, Jill. Just a second, so I'll just find my share my screen. Yep. Um, how do I get that's up? Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite to uh, to present to the workshop workshop today. So today my talk's looking at history matching to reduce PPE uncertainty for for a global uh, aerosol climate model. Uh, see if I can move it on. 
Oh, there we go. So uh, my uh, presentation today is focusing on a paper that came out in uh, the results of a paper that came out in 2020 in ACP, where we're essentially trying to uh, use observational constraint to reduce the effects of uncertainty on, on aerosol forcing. And so the aims of this were to evaluate the uncertainty in predictions of the aerosol forcing from the model due to its parametric uncertainty, and then to constrain that uncertainty using observations through the identification of, of models that are plausible with respect with respect to those observations. So that was the aims of this. And so here's the PPE that, um, that we used uh, in this study. So this is, uh, I guess, a precursor really to the P PPE that Leighton has shown us uh, earlier on in the, in the workshop. Uh, this is a PPE of the HADGEM UKCA Global Aerosol Climate Model, the Met, Met Office model, where we have 26 parameters that we're perturbing. Um, and we generate 235 simulations over the multidimensional, 26 dimensional parameter space that that PPE uh, generates. The data frequency, so we, our output comes out at month, is monthly mean, uh, and we have uh, full year simulations uh, for two anthropogenic emission periods. So we have um, 1850 emissions for the pre industrial and 2008 for the present, present day simulations. And I should say that it's nudged as well to horizontal winds. And, and temperatures as well. The main parameters that we're focusing on here is, is aerosol emission and process parameters. So there's no uh, cloud-based parameters in, in this ensemble. It really is just the aerosol parameters looking at different types of emissions, removal properties, uh, size of aerosol, and all sorts of things like that. And this relates to emulation. And obviously the history matching is the thing that I'm, I'm focusing on, on today. So this slide just shows um, the observations that we used in this study. So we had a real uh, variety of, of observations, six different aerosol properties that we looked at in total. Here's the four largest sets of observations from those. And, and you can see that we've got really variable coverage across, across the globe with these observations. Uh, we've uh, uh, spatially, both spatially and temporally. So we have um, data from large networks, mostly concentrated over the Northern hemisphere uh, for those. Um, and also data, though, from ship and air aircraft campaigns, and that's where we tend to have lower temp temporal coverage. But in total, we had over 9,000 gridded observations that we used in the study to compare to compare to the model. So just to, just to really highlight the scale of the analysis, we had 26 perturbed parameters, so a 26-dimensional parameter uncertainty space to, to explore. From, and from that, we generated a million model variants using Gaussian process emulation. And we compared each of those model variants, each of those parameter combinations to each of our 9,000 in situ measurements of these six different aerosol properties. So really large scale. Uh, you've possibly seen this, this picture before today, but this is our approach to, to uh, reduce the uncertainty. This is, we use a history matching approach. And essentially what we're doing is ruling out the regions of parameter space that just aren't consistent with our observations. And for this study, we use quite a detailed implausibility metric to do that. So essentially what we do, we um, generate uh, a million variants from the using emulators of the model. And then we compare those to the observations with this metric and models that compare well, we retain, we retain those as plausible models and anything that compares poorly, we reject and, and, and we don't use those combinations. And essentially, we're looking to see how when we constrain something that we can observe, how that can then feed through to, uh, to potential constraint on something that we can't observe, like, like the aerosol forcing. So this, uh, this uh, slide here just shows uh, that implausibility metric that, that we used for, for that comparison. I'm not going to go into huge details on this. There's, there's not time in the short presentation. But essentially what this implausibility metric does is look at the dif distance between the observation and the model output. And then it standardizes that distance, that difference, um, with all the different uncertainties that, that come into the comparison process. So we have. Uh, estimates, estimates, sorry, of emulator uncertainty. So the fact that we use an emulator and not the model itself, measurement uncertainties, and also structural uncertainty here. But another one of those is a key uncertainty that we also put into this is what we call representation uncertainty. And this is thinking as well about spatial and temporal differences in resolution between the observations and, and, and the model itself and how that might also feed into those uncertainties. And the idea here is that the smaller uh, the value of this implausibility metric, I, the more plausible that that um, model variant is with respect to that given observation. 
And so we uh, evaluate this for all our variants over all our observations, and we bring those together for, for our constraints uh, in as robust a, a way as we possibly can. So here I'm just showing uh, the results of, of the study. So basically from the beginning of the paper to the end of the paper here, but essentially you can see here that through this methodology, we're able to constrain the uncertainty on some of our parameters, and we also get reasonable constraint on our observables. And it's worth noting here that in this study, we've actually rejected over 98% of our uh, model variants. So we only have around 2% of the variants left as retained as plausible. But when we do this constraint and we feed this through to our aerosol forcing response, we actually find that our uh, constraint that we achieved there is relatively weak. So uh, it's a reduction in the 95% confidence interval of only around 8%, 8% which, is, which is quite disappointing really after, after the effort that we, we went to with this. But we've 16. been able to, thanks Leighton, we've been able to think about, you know, why is this happening? And we, one of the major problems that we see in this is the effect of what we call compensating errors. So otherwise known as equifinality, where we can actually understand the state of the compare get a really good comparison to the aerosol current state but actually that just when you predict something it just the the uncertainty diverges it out and we get poor constraint on the response and so there's several uh, challenges that i want to highlight uh, from this work uh, that we need to really address to try and improve our constraint process here one of those is thinking about the accuracy and realism of of representation errors so Presently, we put a really simplistic form on this and we use exactly the same percent of observation value as the error for all the different observation types everywhere. And we know that that's not realistic. So if we can improve that, we can see potential for really changing the impossibilities around and, and actually improving our constraint more. Another thing to think about really is the actual resolution that we, we do our comparisons at. So the resolution that we use, well, if we use a really high resolution, we're going to have quite poor representation error, but if we, or high representation error, sorry, but if we have a low resolution, then you've got more of this error compensation, this equifinality. So is there a compromise between that that will be an optimal resolution that we really should be using? And also Leighton uh, really pointed to this to think about um, what actual what actual metrics are we using for our comparison? So we've seen with this study that just using the aerosol state variables themselves doesn't give us much constraint. But actually, um, if we could think about uh, metrics that will have similar relationships between the parameters there's, that the forcing has to the parameters, then we can maybe do do a bit better. And these these effects are all essentially going into reducing the effects of equifinality, which is which is a really important thing we need to think about. I also put in here, I can't sort of finish the talk without mentioning structural error, um, but Leighton has sort of shown um, where we've sort of moved on with thinking about structural errors, actually exploiting the dense sampling that we have in a PPE to understand what those structural errors, errors might actually be. And I think the real key point that I want to make is that the parametric uncertainty and the structural uncertainty aren't separate things. Often they're kind of investigated independently and really we need to be focusing more on how we can actually do this as a joint, uh, joint effort to look at these things simultaneously uh, a lot more. Um, so I'll stop there. I think I've probably gone over time. I apologize. <laughs> That's great, Jill. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? I know this worked quite well, so it's not fair for me to ask one. Uh, there is. So Ben, go ahead if you want to ask, ask your question briefly. Yeah, I, 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 so I, th I think I think in the discussion afterwards we should have uh, we should have a, a wider discussion on what we all mean by structural errors. So I think we should punt that to the discussion phase. Because there's been like a few different people have said different things, and so I think that's worth talking about. But specifically on this on, on, on this work, so. I wonder your your approach is to to build a very comprehensive metric, and then ultimately, you know, you would you're, you're disappointed that, that 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 you didn't have a strong constraint on the aerosol. But, but and sort of and, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have the the emergent constraint people who say you know we should take one metric, and this one metric correlates with the thing that we're interested in. And so I I wonder whether there's a happy medium whether you know you're perhaps like putting in yeah which, which are entirely uncorrelated to the thing you're trying to constrain or actually just adding noise effectively even if you know even if yeah essentially yeah absolutely and i think i think the work that leighton's shown us earlier to sort of try and focus in on observations that we know are more related to the 
actual parameter relationships that we want to constrain for forcing. So the brute force approach clearly is, isn't the best way to go, I think, because that's essentially what we did here. We need to be more um, picky, maybe is the best way, but um, I, I can't think of the right word, but we need to be more focused on the observations that we that we utilize for this. But yes, um, sorry, Lathan. It's OK. It's definitely something we should come back and discuss in more detail. Absolutely. Both aspects of that. Yeah. Great work. Um, Yun, if you'd like to, Jill, stop sharing. Yes. Now, we'll um, move on to Yun Qian. You can share when you're ready, Yun. That's clear, Yun. Yeah, the uh, Wi-Fi is not very good at my hotel room, so I may uh, turn off my camera for a moment until Q and A. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. I'm uh, going to briefly introduce uh, our work using parametric sensitivity analysis based on short PPE simulation uh, to better understand cloud physics and properization in uh, USDLE E3 SF. E3SM atmosphere model that Claudia already uh, preferred mentioned that model. Mm -hmm. So as we developed a new model or incorporated a new features in a climate model, we usually uh, needed to tune in the model uh, to make the model results matching with observation as much as possible. One challenge, one challenge we often count is uh, the benefit of tuning one parameter may offset the benefit of tuning another parameter or improvement in uh, one region may uh, lead to the degradation of model fatality in another region or improving one interest variable but uh, degrading uh, another interest variables. This is partly because the parameter values uh, in conventional global climate model are usually temporary and spatially cons constant. But the model response, however, uh, to parameter perturbation may vary across different regions and the climate uh, regimes, uh, which may motivate a need to uh, better understand the model behaves and physics at a uh, regional scale and the process level. So here is a quick, a quick summary of our PPE simulation. Just a few highlights. First, we uh, selected 18 parameters in deep convection scheme, shallow cloud scheme, and micro and uh, uh, macro physics uh, schemes. And the second highlight is this is a short simulation, we only around five days, uh, because in this study, our focus is cloud and convection, which are uh, fast processes. We know uh, cloud processes are a major uh, source of bias in current climate models. Uh, running short simulation certainly uh, is also in order to save computational time uh, compared with a single long simulation take days uh, to months to finish. The advantage of the large number of short simulation is we can find hundreds or even thousands of simulation as one big job to get the job done in supercomputer within a very short turnaround time uh, because the major purpose of this simulation is to help model tuning so we have to get this pp simulation done very quickly so uh, we also run the 12 examples members corresponding to uh, 12 months for each sampling point and totally we conducted 256 multiplied by 12 example simulation at a rather modest cost and workload time so now let's look at the uh, results this is how the model uh, responds to parameter perturbation across different regions. As shown on the left side of figure, we selected uh, six regions uh, to represent a different climate and cloud regime for our analysis. So region of ocean um, uh, along GPCI cross section uh, from deep convection transition to stratic cumulus to ma marine boundary cloud. Uh, three regions over uh, land, uh, Amazon region, uh, Southern Great Plains and Arctic, representing the tropic uh, middle latitude and the high latitude land, respectively. So, right side figure shows the relative importance or sensitivity of uh, 18 uh, parameters and interaction terms uh, to short wave cloud forcing across uh, six regions. The relative importance of the parameter to the uh, short wave cloud forcing uh, varies across region. And C1 in club uh, scheme is one of the most influential. Uh, parameters in all six regions, especially over ocean. And the tau is also very sensitive over land and the tropic ocean. So overall, the interaction terms 
uh, white color at the actually the top of the column account for around uh, twenty percent of the total variance at the leading of us larger than uh, in global mean quantity. So uh, uh, this slide shows the primary sensitivity uh, along the GPCI uh, transect uh, from a deep convection in left side to straight cumulus to cumulus transition to marine boundary cloud in, in the right side. Uh, the uh, location of the GPCI transect is sh shown uh, in the left side of the slide. Uh, we know the uh, different cloud regime uh, around the uh, GPCI transect play a very important role in modulating the atmosphere circulation uh, in tropic and subtropic. Uh, but the global weather and the climate model have a large error or spread uh, in the representation of the clouds along the, uh, this GPCI transect. So over tropical ocean with uh, active uh, deep convections, uh, no surprising, uh, the primate in a deep convection scheme uh, such as Tau, DMP, DZ, uh, DP1, C, the ocean are all important. Uh, they together contributed to around the 60% to the total variance. Over transitional area, uh, the role of the C1, C8, and the gamma uh, in club of shallow uh, scheme gradually increased. So over marine boundary region, uh, very right side of the figure, the C1, C8, and the gamma become dominant uh, contributors, uh, accounting for more than 60% uh, of the uh, total variance. So this uh, slide shows the response curve of the shortwave cloud forcing to nine key parameters over six regions. Uh, basically, we divided the 256 uh, simulation into eight beings based on the each uh, parameter value. So we highlight uh, two parameters, DMPDZ, a, a parameter associated with uh, increment rate and the tau. So we can find that uh, shortwave cloud forcing response to same parameter uh, differently over different regions. For example, as a red side goes highlighted uh, with increasing DMPDZ, shortwave cloud forcing decrease over uh, both tropical ocean and land. Um, uh, but increase over the middle latitude, uh, like land as SGP, similar uh, with tau. So to, ex to explain those uh, differences, we have done uh, some further analysis, which I may uh, don't have time to introduce in detail, and also because those analysis results are very model specific and uh, uh, parameter specific. So, second, the last slide, uh, which is uh, showing the how uh, parameter sensitivity involved with prediction uh, lens from day one to uh, day five, because this is short simulation, which we try to uh, understand how robust this uh, sensitivity. Uh, is how they depend on the uh, time. So it basically for uh, short wave cloud forcing and the low cloud fraction, their sensitivity and the relative importance are very uh, stable within uh, start from one day one to day five over the, at least over the marine boundary cloud regime near coast, uh, California coast. But for the high cloud, the parameter, for example, here, a, a parameter associated with ice cloud is dominated uh, contributor, but it decay very quickly and very unstable. So this gave us uh, some information like what kind of cloud regime our results based on a short simulation are more robust and the others are not. So I'm not going to read the summary, but I just want to mention the last bullet point and this simulate this study you know, improve our process uh, level understanding on model physics and the parameterization, especially those associated with uh, fast process like cloud convection and provide insights for developing more advanced spare space awareness uh, parameterization schemes. Uh, I, I have two extra slides, uh, but I don't go into introduce more in more detail. Just want to let you know, we also have done some PPE simulation based on WOLF regional model uh, for uh, window energy study. And uh, actually this is the window energy study and also for solar energy study. Uh, and those uh, simulation and the results not only help as better understand those processes associated with the wind speed and the solo irradiance, but also, for example, the spatial distribution of those primary trans sensitivity can help, such as like in site selection for wind, wind farmers or for the uh, solo panel fields, for example. I will just stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Yun. Uh, are there any questions on Yun's main presentation? I see uh, Ben has his hand up again. We've got around a minute in total, Ben, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so th this is this is interesting. Like, the, obviously, you can 
have a significantly greater ensemble size if you work with very short simulations. I was wondering whether you have any intuition on to what degree like the climatological biases in, 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 in top of atmosphere forcing, for example, or radiative balance are related to these short five day periods. Have you have you let some of them go longer to see to see how much intuition you have about the sort of the climatological scale? Yeah, we did some like uh, one year or five year PP simulation, uh, but different um, mo model version, and uh, we did some uh, comparison for between short and relatively longer simulation. Mm -hmm. Certainly depends on what target, what uh, interest variable we are talking about for those fast process, as I mentioned, like cloud and uh, convection, uh, five days of short, short simulation in, in some air, some cloud regime, some area may more consistent with those uh, long-term simulation, but some other may not. Uh, regarding, you know, the TOA, the forcing uh, TOA radiation flux balance, for example, uh, I think probably, uh, need more longer simulation rather than a few days. Thanks yeah, very much. Awesome. You make it work. Thanks, guys. Uh, John, John Rostron is our last speaker for this session. And uh, we've kept very closely to time. So John, you've got your full time as planned. Uh, sorry, can you hear me, Leighton? Sorry, I can yeah. unmute myself. Uh, can you see my screen? It's fine. You just have to put it into presentation mode. Okay, brilliant. And is that flicking forwards? And uh, you're not in presentation mode yet. Okay. Uh, let me see. If... Can you see that? No, that must be coming up on your other screen. I think. So, so, uh, so I think you're. So I think you're sharing your um your PowerPoint. Uh, hang on. Yeah, so hang on. Uh, so I want to share my PowerPoint. Yeah. Can you see this? Yeah. That... We can still see the slide or organizer, not the, uh, the presentation mode. So you can't see this when I go into presentation mode. We no? can still no. Try again, John. No, it's okay. I'll try and share my whole screen and see if that works. Because the um... you're trying Andrew's tricks from earlier, but uh, like you said, uh, it takes some practice. Uh, okay. How about this? If I do that, Is you're that away. Better? That's great. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. So. Uh. Yeah. Thank you. Uh. Yeah. So my name's uh, John Rostron. So I'm going to be. Uh, talking today about some work we've done uh, comparing feedbacks and structural errors across three atmosphere only PPEs that we've run at the Met Office. So this is work that I've done with David Sexton, Kali Furtado and Yoko Tashima. Uh, so this is my summary slide. So just to pick out some key information here. So we're running um, PPEs of the HADGEM3 model in three different configurations, GA7.05, which I'll call GA7, uh, GA8 and GA9. Um, we're perturbing uh, various atmosphere, aerosol and land parameters in these ensembles. Uh, and we run uh, five-year fixed SST experiments, so AMIP and AMIP future experiments, which we use to test the performance of our models and the diversity of climate feedbacks um, across uh, parameter space. And we're doing that um, partly in the context of developing coupled model simulations. So this GA7 PPE was used to develop um, the climate projections for the UK, uh, UK CP18. Um, and the GA8 and GA9 PPEs um, we're, have been built more recently to help with the development of the next set of projections to update uh, UK CP18. Um, and also, uh, increasingly, our PPEs are being uh, integrated into the model development process um, in the Met Office. Uh, so we now kind of routinely run PPEs based on um, frozen configurations of the HADGEM3 model. Um, so just to highlight some of the differences between the ensembles. So 
As you might expect, we have various updates to the model physics. Uh, a key change there has been the introduction of a new prognostic entrainment scheme that was introduced at GA8 and has been extended um, in GA9. And also there's been changes to the parameters that we perturb. So some parameters get added, some get removed as different physics schemes kind of move in and out of the science configuration. Um, so for GA8 and GA9, we're typically uh, perturbing around 70 of those parameters. Um, GA7 had a few less than that and our ensemb typical ensemble sizes are about 500 members. So um, one important test of um, the diversity in our PPEs um, is the spread of climate feedbacks, uh, which we diagnose with the AIM at Future experiments. Um, so these are an important predictor of the future warming that we'd expect to see in the coupled models. Um, and uh, so this plot on the right is showing a summary of these feedbacks across the three PPEs. Uh, and the, the various components. There's quite a lot going on here. So I'll just point out the main result, which is that for the GA9 PPE, um, we find typically higher feedback values um, compared to the GA8 um, PPE in orange, GA7 in blue. Um, and that's associated with a higher expected level of warming. And we're really not sampling um, the kind of lower feedback values with the GA9 PPE. Um, and that potentially will exacerbate a feature which was seen in the UK CP18 projections where we had um, a higher level of, of warming with a narrow spread compared to CMIT5 models. So that's not a great result in terms of developing our new projections and trying to get more diversity into those. Uh, so we can look into that in a bit more detail and we found that uh, it's the, the uh, clear sky feedback component that um, seems to be uh, causing a lot of this. Certainly the, um, the narrowing of the range at this bottom end seems to be coming from this clear sky component. Uh, and then we've used um, parameter sensitivity uh, studies with emulators uh, to pick out the key parameters. So um, the, for the clear sky feedbacks in GA8, uh, these are the top parameters and there were two parameters in there in particular that were removed from GA9 and they were removed due to this prognostic entrainment scheme and we've been testing the effects of removing those and, and we're, we're kind of finding that the introduction of this uh, prognostic entrainment scheme is really uh, driving a big part of what of these um, feedback distribution shifts. So um, I mentioned that we also look at uh, model errors. So when we were developing uh, UK CP18, uh, we applied performance-based filtering to the GA7 uh, PPE. Uh, and we found that the resulting uh, feedback distributions were affected by a structural model bias. And um, that ended up placing a too tight a constraint on the lower feedback values here. And that kind of propagated through into our uh, UK CP18 projections. And the structural uh, bias that we found was in uh, lo long wave cloud forcing. So you can see that here where uh, the PPE distribution lies to one side uh, of the observations. Um, so we're kind of keen now to use our PPEs to look at these structural biases um, in more detail. Um, they're a really nice tool for obviously exposing these structural errors um, and for studying um, the differences between different configurations. So this is the same um, histogram, but for GA8. So um, a complication here is that, um, as I mentioned, there are uh, kind of different parameters in these two ensembles. So some parameters got added, some got removed for GA8. Um, so uh, making a kind of point to point comparison of these histograms is difficult, but we've been addressing that um, using emulators again, uh, where we um, take samples of the same values of parameters, which are common to both of the PPEs. And then at each of those common parameter samples, we average over the effects of parameters which are unique to each of those ensembles. And that allows us to basically take the difference between these distributions. Uh, and that's what's, okay, great. Um, and that's what's shown on the, um, the right here. Um, so this is showing that there's a systematic shift in the long wave cloud forcing between these two ensembles that's occurring across the parameter space where the GA8 PPE is kind of moving more towards observations than GA7. 
Um, so what we also found um, had an impact on our performance filtering for GA7 was that the um, unperturbed model, so this is using the standard uh, parameter values that model developers have chosen, um, that's not always uh, indicative of the uh, the kind of bulk of the PPE. So you can see that the standard model value is much closer to observations than the PPE mean. And that's particularly noticeable when you look at the changes. So the, G uh, the GA8 standard value is basically the same as GA7. Um, and that's really not reflective of what's going on in the, the changes in the structural bias between um, GA7 and 8 that, that I showed earlier. Um, so something that um, we've been considering as a potential alternative to the standard model is um, a so-called modal model. So this is where you take the uh, parameter values of the peaks of your parameter distributions and whether the flat top, you take the middle point. Um, and when we run that through our AMIP simulations, we find that that gives a kind of better representation of the PPE means and certainly the um, the changes in them, those means um, compared to the standard model. So um, Obviously, to do a kind of fuller analysis of this, we need to consider lots more variables. This is just for long wave cloud forcing. But in principle, the kind of idea of, um, of using an alter alternative single model, which could um, better represent the um, changes in structural biases between these configurations, that could be really useful for, for model development. Uh, and it could also be useful for us in our um, filtering as, as a way of mitigating the uh, the impacts of the standard model. And I'll just say, I know I'm running out of time. So um, we've been uh, also extending this to look at things spatially as well. Um, and I'll just leave up my uh, my summary slide. Take any questions. Thanks, John. It's really exciting to see uh, the evolution of these PPEs, generations of PPEs. That's great. Uh, Andrew has a clarifying question. He'd like to know if you've... Uh, corrected for the fact that models are often biased with respect to long wave cloud radiative effects, unless you've used the right cloud cleared observations? Uh, no, we haven't done that, no. Um, and um... That'll, that'll make things a lot better because what happens is series, there, there's a special series product for cloud forcing to compare to observations that Right, right now, if you just use the straight observations, they only use the clear sky locations to calculate the long wave versus the cloudy. So it's artificially dry. And they have a new product that's cloud cleared that actually tries to account for the fact that the clouds are in humid environments and it really affects the long wave. And it's a couple watts lower, basically, like a water, okay. like two watts lower. Um, okay, that's it's available as part of their EBF, EBAF product, but that's, in other words, those, those distributions are common to most climate models because the observations are probably a little skewed here. So. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll definitely look into that. That sounds so. Uh, yeah, really and also I, really I just had one quick question. The standard model you're talking about, I, I really didn't understand. Is this an emulator by that standard model that you're saying you're not sampling the emulator, the set, the right when you're using uniform distributions? No. Or is so. The model itself? That, that is the model itself that, that I'm putting on there, yeah, yeah. Um, I, so it is comparing it to emulated, these these are emulated distributions and that is the kind of actual model, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Good questions, okay. Thank you very much, John. Plenty to discuss in the afternoon session, but before we get to that, we're gonna give ourselves a 20 minute break. So if you're interested, you can head over to Wonder Me. Uh, meet the speakers from this session or just go to a coffee or tea corner and have a chat there and that uh, we'll be back here I suggest again a 20 minute break would make sense and we'll come back for uh, 5.50 in the uh, the time we're sticking to <laughs> okay you see 10 I had a chat and um, and we we're, we're raring to go so we've covered a lot of ground and there's lots of really interesting talks um, so far this morning or this afternoon uh, um, and um, so we're going to have a discussion session now. It's going to go on for the next hour and 20 minutes. And we want to focus at the beginning of that, uh, that session on, on kind of picking up on the strands that came up this morning um, and, and to provide you an opportunity to, to kind of expand and discuss some of the issues. And then we want to um, move the discussion a bit more, a bit, a bit, uh, move the discussion out more wider and pick up a few themes in the second half of this session. 
So Jan and myself will formally be, be, be chairing this, but I'm sure that all the organisers will, 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 will chip in the different parts of it. So uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, um, does anyone have any one slide presentations they would like to share? Um, I suggest if you do to, to put it as a question um, in, in the Zoom and we'll, we'll pick, pick you up there. Um, and while we're waiting for people to, to suggest a slide, um, uh, um, are there any, um, does anyone want to start us off with, with discussion of any of the talks we've heard so far today? So Ben, uh, so, so go ahead. I, I, I missed that, but I'm just going to carry on. Um, so uh, uh, there's a few things we want to talk about, but 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 what one one thread I think we should pick up is there's quite a lot of groups who are simultaneously thinking about how to move on from AMIP simulations to coupled simulations, and uh, and. The, uh, and as far as I'm aware, it's only really the Met Office who've done it and were scarred by that event. Um, and so I, I guess uh, I, 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 I guess my question slash discussion is, you know, what, 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 what it would be interesting to get a, like a report from you guys on like, um, you know, what went wrong and what went right, but like as a wider discussion, um, you know, do we need to be thinking about flux corrections? Um, do we need to be thinking about super long spin-ups for ocean configurations? Um, you know, how do we how do we make that transition from 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 AMIT world to to coupled world? And do we need to? That, that's my discussion point. So I think it's a really good discussion, and and I, I think there's various threads we can pick up on there, and I think it sits in part of a wider discussion about what we can learn from from simpler models. Um, um, so uh, can I call on you, David or John? Do you want to say something about the Met Office experience that, that Ben talked about? Oops, can you hear me? Um, okay, so. Yeah, um, I work at the Met Office and we ran some UK climate um, projections, which were based on basically we were shooting at about 25 members, perturbed parameter members, um, there were a couple of models, and we did a whole kind of traceable hierarchy of ruling out poor points in parameter space. So we used five day runs, we then threw out a load of parts of parameter space and then focused on five year runs. And throughout more parts of parameter space and we thought we've got some really nice plausible atmospheric configurations and then we coupled them um, to the ocean and there were i guess there were a couple of things that happened um, they are flux adjusted runs we knew that perturbed parameter ensembles explore a wide range of top of atmosphere balance so we had a, a method for flux adjusting um, in UKCP, we had to take a shortcut, but since that Kuniko, I don't know if Kuniko can add to what I'm saying later on, if she's still on the call, um, but we've now got a, a proper way of calibrating up flux adjustments per parameter combination that we want to try out as a couple more run. Even then, and even though we were only perturbing atmosphere parameters, and that includes aerosol and land, we were getting um, spin downs in our AMOC in about half of our runs. So in the end, really only 13 of the 25 um, ended up okay. Um, and Kuniko has done some work in kind of predicting that. Um, she has found, I don't know, Kuniko, are you, are you here? Um, she might jump in in a minute because it'll probably take a while to unmute and stuff as she is, um, but she has, looked at the start of the calibration runs where she tried to calibrate the flux adjustments and she's found in the first 10 years of those um, if 
you have to have a set of runs actually you have to have a set of spin up runs to work with but in the 25 members that we've got she's got she can look at the first 10 years of the calibration run and look at what happened to the amoc by the end of the spin the calibration run and she can predict which ones basically um spin down she's writing it on the paper at the moment um there are various places in the world where things are sensitive to i can remember that the runoff from the amazon and the orinoco was one um, arctic water flux is another um, i i can't remember the third one but there were three parts of the world and of course whether your ocean model spins down might be different to why nemo spins down um, presumably different ocean models are more sensitive to different parts of the world i think it was um it was over the spg actually was the third region sort of uh heat fluxes and water fluxes over there so you have this problem where some of the members kind of die because the amoc gets implausibly just weak um, the other thing that happened to us and john showed this in his talk was that when we constrained it we actually narrowed the range of feedbacks in the amip the kind of cloud feedbacks you can see in the amip future runs and that led us to that really narrow kind of range of global warming and of course when you the whole point of the ppe to and andrew had a nice example earlier where he had this he had the um the CAN model's PPE was uh, pretty much exploring a lot of the range of CMIP. That's what we were kind of aiming at. And because um, we run a, run a load of high resolution downscale models of this, and it just didn't happen. We ended up with a bunch of high warming runs, all with climate sensitivities above four, um, but they were the ones with more plausible mean climate performance. So I'd say there's a, there's a couple of pitfalls there that you can, that'll probably affect everyone. But you, we do think we have, well, Kenneka has run it without flux adjustment to see what's happened and we've got the spin ups, but we haven't really looked into it in too much detail. Um, I don't know whether Kenneka is on the call to add anything to that, but that's pretty much summarizes it, I think. Hopefully that's useful, Ben. Yeah, it is. I mean, is your sense that the, that the flux adjustments were contributing towards the AMOC instability? Um, I would say I don't think that's the case, though, um, I do know that, um, I can't remember which way it is, but if you um, increase the top of the atmosphere flux, I think, or maybe, or in balance, or, or make it more negative, one of those two actually strengthens the AMOC, because you're, um, you're kind of making, I guess, the, um, you're driving more of the circulation if you, if you change the temperature of the surface layers, and you can do that easily with the global temperature, top of the atmosphere flux, but of course that's, a few watts per meter squared, and that's going to lead to SST biases that are probably um, not plausible enough for regional projections, which we were interested in. Mm -hmm. it's really it's lovely. So my sense is that, that this is a kind of yeah. issue that, that a few groups are thinking about. So I, I, I guess, uh, Greg, you've got some experience of this already, uh, and, and perhaps the DOE groups uh, are also thinking about this from the high and low variant context. And I know that uh, Salua, who's going to talk tomorrow, is also thinking about this. Uh, uh, Greg, do you, want to, do you want to say a bit about your, um, about your experience? So, so in our, um, in, the, in the case of the NASA GIFS climate model, you know, uh, the, the design of our approach is to give um, configurations that are in radiative balance at the top of the atmosphere, right? And that have, um, you know, good, uh, good tuned climatology against a number of, you know, satellite or other observational diagnostics. So that's our starting point. The difference is, you know, for each, for each of those, uh, each of those similar states, and you know, we're we're we have similar, you know, we picked we picked the four best out of you know the the several twenty we had, um, several ten we had, and um, you know, everything looked great. It was like, but they just had really different parameter combinations, giving these similar mean states. Long wave series, you know, long wave short wave was good at the top of the atmosphere. We were in you know radiated balance um, as well. And then we just ran the, we thought, well, you know, let's run, let's, let's make these our four official CMIP configurations. And that's when we ran into problems. And I, I would say, I would say it's been a year uh, or more of just trying to get these four to like a couple, you know, sort of like, well, maybe we can, maybe we can uh, modify ocean parameters so that we use the same ocean to talk with the four different atmospheres, or do we have to like change the ocean parameters? to um, in such a way that they work individually, you know, like there's sort of an ocean tuning for each parameter to each atmospheric tuning. Um, but we haven't made like,
we can't find it, it, it's been hard we haven't even been able to find like a uh, um a an ocean that works with just four um can i ask are those is it also a mock or are you seeing problems with the whole climate we, yeah, system we, no, it's, it's, it's surprisingly the climatology that emerged don't look terribly different from what like the atmosphere still look good. You know, I mean, you have some of the biases that creep in like double ITCZ and those sort of things. But in general, it, it looks like, oh, like it's, it's going to behave well. But yeah, it's so it's but then what happens is after it keeps running the AMOP, um, the AMOP weakens or shuts down. We have uh, the CI, the CI starts, uh, starts uh, changing extent that in, in plausible ways. So and, and then there's some other things that the ocean group. We'll report on but that i'm not um you know given my expertise i'm not uh, i forgot i've forgotten what it is but um yeah and it, it we're, we're literally dealing with it at present um and we've had these atmospheric configurations now available for two years and, and they've been struggling with this i'm not sure a problem is it that you have such, such a small number of ensemble members um, in the coupled runs, because you're never going to have very many. So you're only picking a really small number out of the big parameter space. Yeah, so we, we just far sample of the parameters, isn't it, that were causing so much uncertainty in the, in the uncoupled. It was, partly, it was partly like what we were trying to do. We were trying to see, oh, like, let's pick, because we wanted to actually uh, submit all four to CMIP6 um, as, as our CMIP6 configurations. And we picked the ones that had really good climatologies and were, you know, um, looked really good against all of the all the observational metrics, but were almost like the most orthogonal parameter state space. So we deliberately just handpicked of the of the, the 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 whole tens that emerged from the machinery. You know, there's a whole PDF of of parameter combinations. We picked the ones almost that like, oh, this parameter is so different from this. This set is so different from that set, but they have similar climatologies and similar TOA radiation radiative imbalances. Let's go with those. So we, because we, we wanted to ask the question, like, well, does that does that matter? Like, what does that mean for climate projections? Now we could have presumably picked closer ones, um, and maybe we wouldn't run to this issue. But um, but we were, we were trying to go for like parametric diversity, basically, while while constraining similar mean state um, results. So uh, yeah. open to open to open to ideas. Like this is we're we're struggling with it as we speak. So, 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 so David's got his hand up. So, so, so David, do you want to come back in on, on this? Yeah, um, we've uh, we're trying different things at the Met Office now. But I mean, we just to be perfectly honest, to be quite open in the community about this, we we just tried to couple up our GC five, which is using the GA nine atmosphere configuration that John was talking about, as the third of the PPEs that he did, um, and that that model is doing all sorts of strange things in the control it's drifting even though it's meant to be in toa balance but one of the things um i've done some auto tuning um with those guys because we're trying to do exactly the same thing as gist did that claudia is trying to do which is to come up with alternative to this to the the model developers tuned version you know to yeah. explore a range of maybe different ecs's or something like that um we're now seeing we don't know whether it worked or not but um um, we've developed a kind of implied heat transport diagnostic, which has um, basically you take the surface fluxes and it's like a Laplacian operator and it works out basically the, the flow that you think would be implied in the ocean. Um, some models, you can do this to all the CMIP models and some of them look absolutely horrendous. Um, ours aren't looking too bad, but as Kuniko showed, it was, it was just key regions, really small. I mean, for the river runoff, it was like two rivers where Amazon and Orinoco were really affecting things. So that's where your rainfall over the Amazon. That's really hard. But we, we definitely are trying to trying to find diagnostics with which to add additional constraints, which hopefully are diagnostics that capture maybe more implied effects in the coupled model from the atmosphere only models. Um, so the, I've tried the implied heat transport and we've also used uh, constraints on the water fluxes, the net water fluxes over different ocean basins. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I noted that. Like, so the, the other thing that's been, you know, I don't know what everyone, what the group thinks, but, um, you know, the, the, this is sort of like assuming, I guess, that the structure of the ocean is, or, or that the ocean is, is kind of all good, right? I mean, are, are, is it amounting to, to um, 
saying, well, we're not, we're, we can't change the ocean too much. We can modify the atmosphere. And if there's a problem, we have to figure out what atmosphere we need to use to make the ocean work. You know, is, is there some compromise where you can sort of like address the, address the physics in the ocean and the atmosphere simultaneously? Um, has anyone, has anyone played around with, with that? So, so, so Kuniko um, has um, earlier in her career, I'm not sure if you want to comment on, 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 on looking at paired perturbations of the ocean and the atmosphere, um, Kuniko. Um, hello. Um, so the what we found or what I found um, in looking at the fluxes, the coupled fluxes is that uh, the initially the um, heat flux into the SPG region kind of triggers the how the AMOC is going to behave um, later on. So if we look for perturbations that um, have initially um, more negative heat flux, anomalous, anomalously negative heat flux into the SPG or not anomalously too warm heat flux into the SPG, I think that will work. Can I go? Kunika, how much do you think that would depend on the different types of ocean model that are kind oh, of yes. uh, Yeah, I mean, yes, that would um, depend on, on is model dependent. So I guess that's for our model. So I guess um, it's the really the buoyancy flux, depending on the model. It's heat for it was heat for us, but it might be water for other models. So, so, so I think this discussion is really important, and, and as a global modeler, it's really part of our, my bread and butter. So I'm, I'm, I, I could follow this for the next hour and a half, but I'm aware that we have a broader, uh, a, a broader audience here. Uh, um, before, before we brought in it out, uh, Leighton, I think you had a question, and I was just going to briefly touch base with Claudia and Benj if they had any thoughts uh, about this. But Leighton, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, Ben. It's uh, it's pretty simple, really, from an uninformed perspective. Um, for David's case. In Kuniko's case, they had like five year simulations, which is presumably just one phase of the AMOC, and they're constrained to that physical atmosphere. I'm wondering what if you had two different phases? We obviously have measurements over long enough periods to be able to do that. What if you constrained to extreme phases of the AMOC? Would that improve your uh, results when coupling? So, 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 so Kuniko, uh, do you want to pick up that question? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite follow the question. So, so I, uh, to paraphrase it, Leighton, I, I think uh, Leighton was asking, to what extent does does the the period, the five year period we chose to do the the, the prescribed SSD calibrations, influence our, our 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 idea of what an acceptable parameter set is? And if you'd done the same uh, calibration but with a different five year period in, in a different phase in the Aim of variability. Would you have had a different uh, um, uh, criteria for? Or well, more importantly, if you did over multiple phases simultaneously, and have a calibration that included a number of phases. Um, right. So we actually looked at two, I guess, different experiments of the. AMIP like type experiments. I wonder if that's what you're what related to what you're saying. And so one was the present day AMIP run, and the other was the present day, except for aerosols uh, forcing, which was pre industrial. And I think for both, I looked at both of them, and um, the what I found was that the Arctic surface temperature in the AMIP runs and, and the meridional wind that blows from air, uh, cold Arctic air into the SPG region um, pretty much, um, how do you say, 
was, it was highly correlated with the, the coupled AMOC. So um, at least in those two experiments, um, they showed similar correlations to the AMOC. So possibly if we do different kinds of AMIP experiments, it might, yeah, there's a possibility that it would constrain, uh, correlate with the AMOC further, I'm not sure. So, so, so thanks, thanks Kiriko. Can I just check with the DOA groups, uh, uh, Benj or Claudia, have you thought much about, about, uh, about coupling and to what extent does that influence your design or, or thought processes? I let them so talk. I can't, yeah, I, I really can't speak from experience about this. Um, and it's, I think maybe we are um, uh, lucky in that it's, it's not really our charge yet to find a model that is well-behaved uh, when coupled because we're not yet replacing the expert tuner. We're retaining our expert tuner, but just trying to help speed things up uh, for Chris Golas. Um, and we do expect that a lot, yeah, a lot of these models that we um, are plausible, uh, you know, won't behave well, but, uh, at least as a first pass here, we're kind of starting just where the expert tuners, at least uh, at E3SM start, which is this you know, prescribed present day AMIP-like uh, simulation. Um, and we're not trying to auto-tune beyond that configuration yet. So I, I'm, I'm really, yeah, unable to, to comment. And frankly, I was unaware that, that, that people were having this much trouble it's definitely a little, I mean, it looks more, more challenging than I realized. Uh, and I also know that even the expert tuner, like with the last release of E3SM, there was a long delay while there was some uh, tuning of the ocean. Uh, so it's, it seems like it's always a problem. So, so there's, a, there's a question from Bruce. Um... Hi, uh, actually, I was um, so I'm on the E3SM project working with Claudia and Benj, and I wanted to add a, a couple extra details um, uh, to Benj's response there. So I think one of the things that uh, we do have as a bit of an advantage is we're mostly using the auto tuning to identify uh, parameter sets um, that you know span this range of ECS that Claudia was talking about. Um, but we acknowledge that because we're only looking for really like this, this small subset that we'll actually use in, the, in, these, in these large uh, ensemble configurations, like three different versions, um, that is that is a manageable number that we can do some additional tuning and we can leverage the experience that we've had from uh, prior versions V1, V2 of E3SM when we do a lot of the initial tuning in atmosphere only phase and then in coupling, we've identified knobs that we know are effective for bringing like TOA radiation balance um, back, in, back into something that we like. So we're hopeful that um, the, the auto-tuning effort will give us this opportunity to identify um, three different parameter sets that have sufficiently different cloud feedbacks we expect um, to, to get us a starting point. And then we can uh, hopefully relatively quickly get that, get that, uh, get that uh, hand-tuning process to, to complete the coupled configuration, I think is, is what's likely going to end up um, being, being how we go about it. So thanks, Bruce. I, I think this is a really interesting thread, and I, I, I certainly, from our perspective, I, I, I suspect there'll be a lot of interest in, in in keeping in touch about how we do this. Um, if, if there is, uh, uh, Ben, do you want a, a final question from from the global modeling groups, and then I, I'll broaden it out. Yeah, just just a quick one, I guess. It's just an open question, but like, mum, I guess the question is like, to what degree does the to what degree are the ocean models tuned as a function of the default parameter, uh, the de default atmospheric models? So what, to what degree are we imprinting our atmospheric model biases onto the oceans or is it not at all? Are the ocean models just simply tuned offline? And so this isn't a problem, but if, if they are being tuned, you know, if the AMOC, if, AM, if the AMOC is being calibrated in the context of the fully coupled model, then we shouldn't be treating the ocean configuration as gospel it's just it's a manifestation of the default atmosphere 
I know for E3SM, we tune the ocean um, offline and then usually in the coupled configuration, it's atmosphere um, right. that get changed, but other modeling centers, I don't know. So, 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 uh, um, so I think this is really a nice live issue. And, and um, I, I guess it's part of a wider challenge is, is how do we, uh, um, so we, we've heard talks this morning looking at uh, large, large LED simulations. Um, and, and I guess the, the wider question is, is how do we see the kind of PPEs within our own frameworks as informing the wider systems? Um, and, and so I, I wondered if, um, um, if anyone from the large, large eddy simulation work we, we've heard about or here want to comment about where they see their input endpoints, are they looking to inform the parameterization process itself or are the parameters they're exploring looking to uh, um, uh, uh, say something about what those parameters would do in a, in a, in a in say, a free running AMIT run. Um, I can say a bit about kind of where I see my work going. Um, so obviously with my uh, PPE, it's kind of more the initial conditions that are being perturbed as opposed to the parameters. So I have included one, but um, this was kind of uh, inspired a bit, I guess, by uh, the work by Tak Yamaguchi and Graham Feingold's group. And they were looking at whether there's a faster mechanism for uh, the cases with low aerosol. So I suppose kind of basing off that, it was kind of originally focused on whether, you know, we could answer that question if there was a different mechanism. And then, you know, if there is a, a, an actual different mechanism then that can be represented differently in the global model. So I guess it's kind of informing, um, yeah, those parameterizations, like if you could switch into a different regime um, under certain circumstances, I guess. Yeah, it seems to me um, the LES work is at a much earlier stage than the global work. Um, um, I'm not aware if there was any work on this before we started working with Graham Feingold's group um, a few years back, whether, whether there was a predecessor work that we weren't aware of. But it, I think at this stage, we're just sort of playing around with these models and seeing what we might be able to do with PPEs rather than having a particular long-term strategy in mind. Um, I wonder whether there's, you know, there was a question about whether we should be or could be looking at developing parameterizations, learning about sort of global model parameterizations of shallow clouds and, and things like that by what we're doing with PPEs and um, LES models and all kinds of other questions that come to mind about, you know, a lot of model calibration is done for global models against observations, but there you have, you know, multi-annual runs and lots of observations to use, but what do you use, what observations are you using for sort of calibrating LES simulations? They're really short, they're really noisy, and you know, there's a lot of extra challenges there that I don't think we've really thought through. So I'd certainly like to um, see that area progressed a bit. So Mark also want to quick comment. Yeah, I, I think I, I used to have a fantasy that like, you know, you could do some sort of tuning at the at the LES scale or, or even just like the process level scale. So you do like a laboratory experiment, and learn something about collision coalescence and have it, you know, filter up to the GCM. But <clears throat> I really worry about things uh, more and more. Um, this is actually partly in conversations with Sean Santos, who's at PNNL now, um, about just the the times the time step on which some of these microphysical processes are integrated they don't really converge to the same solutions they do at at um, finer time scales so you're not you're not really solving the physics that you think you're solving um, so that sort of direct uh, I can learn parameters here and transfer them up there it, I, I really worry about that yeah um, but maybe there's some other aspect of, of this question that's that's relevant that's you know uh, getting better understanding of those scales and then using something like an LES to inform a, a GCM via comparison with an SCM. So, you know, there, then you, you might start to look at the interaction of the, um, of the microphysics and the subgrid scale variabilities and use that to inform a better, uh, you know, parameterization of clouds. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, LES have always been used to, to help develop global models. I mean, a lot of parameterizations for the, for the global models came out of work with LES. Uh, um, but now we're beginning to think about PPEs with LES. It, it opens up a whole lot of opportunities, I think, but it's not quite clear how, how we go about it and what the, what the end point would be. Um, but it's worth some, some more thought, I think. You know, it, none of this research is particularly useful if it just stays in LES world. You know, we really do need to get this thing, these in, this information into global models, don't we? Um, so I, I think we should be trying to make that connection through at an early stage in our in our thinking. It, it, I think uh, one of the challenges is what we learned from those uh, small scale model like parameter sensitivity, whether or not transferable, uh, when we go to the large scale global model. It remains an uh, uncertain, uh, uncertain question. We didn't do the uh, LES, but we did uh, do some PPE simulation based on a single column model. We get some conclusion related to cloud feedback, what parameter sensitivity to the cloud feedback. And then we did a similar cloud uh, sensitivity analysis for feedback in 3D uh, global model. We found some aspect is not really transferable to we learned from a single column model to a global model. So I expect they may have similar issue from uh, large AD simulation to the global uh, model because the reason is uh, in the global model, uh, one region could interact, influence another region, right? But uh, what we learned, what we did in the small scale model like LES or single column model, they didn't have this kind of feedback among the different regions, right? So yeah, that's a big challenge here. Yeah. So is the issue that, that the parameters don't mean the same thing um, it, when you go between different scales? Or, or is the issue that the parameters tell you, the constraints of that smaller scale tell you something about parameters, but not enough? That the other things happen when the coupling? I think, first of all, we, we don't. I mean, has anybody even done like constraint of parameters in, in, you know, fine resolution? I mean, I, I you know, with the, the present research, uh, notwithstanding, I think it's, it's sort of the cutting edge frontier. And, and certainly when it comes to learning something from observations, that's, that's a huge challenge. How do you, how do you do that when you have so much uncertainty, uh, initial conditions and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is not a problem with the climate model, is it? It, um, it's, it's a particular problem, I think, with LES is the initial condition uncertainty. And, it, and the initial conditions are not um, just nice profiles like uh, Rachel and uh, Yao Sheng were showing. You know, they, they, have, uh, they have dry layers and they have all kinds of um, you know, wrinkles in the profile that are going to give you a different cloud development, whereas uh, it's not just a nice uh, smooth profile, is it? So if, if you're not measuring that, if you're relying on the analyses, for example, to initialize, uh, you're not quite capturing the real situation to which you're using the observations. So I, I think it's a real challenge there on that sort of scale. But we should think about it. I, I think there's a lot to be gained from it, but I, there's a lot of questions in my mind, much more than on the global scale, I would say. Uh, Yosheng had a question to my point, maybe. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to comment that <clears throat> the initial problem, the, the initial conditions that, that themselves uh, does not just affect <clears throat> the solutions you get. I mean, based on what it sees, uh, initial conditions themselves are, de are determining which part of your simulations are uh, usable. So basically the spin up pro uh, stage, the, the, the length of the spin up or which part of the simulations you need to discard uh, is quite sensitive to the initial conditions. If your initial conditions are very unbalanced with uh, with uh, a part of the model or with each other, then you, you cannot say that, okay, simply because this is from LES, then after two hours being up, which is everyone think believe what's being up sh should be, we, we can treat everything else as truth. So it's still quite sensitive to, uh, so it, I mean, even for this part, it's sensitive to initial conditions.
So um, one of the things that I mentioned in the chat is uh, is that like you know there, there's there's this recent research that uh, Michael Whitty did on multifractal analysis of cloud fields, and he found that uh, cloud and precipitation fields are too smooth and and not intermittent enough compared with observed fields. And he found differences between bulk and bin schemes in this regard, um, but that both of them sort of shared uh, discrepancies with observations. Now that doesn't, you know, it, there's some aspect of that that's maybe a little bit less sensitive to the initial conditions specifically. You're not looking for the, the specific trajectory of a, of a certain cloud field. You're looking at certain characteristics of it that are deficient in some, some sort of way. So I don't think that's gonna solve everything, but it's, it's, it's some sort of uh, analysis which maybe targets uh, some aspect of how the physical sensitivities of our of our physics are are deficient in some critical way, or I guess you could argue maybe okay it's not even critical, but in any case you know it's looking at some sort of observational metric that maybe gets at something that 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 we can actually grab onto. Yeah, there's this tendency to think that we just need to use LES to kind of inform the global, but actually there's a lot of deficiencies in LES themselves. And any work we're going to be doing on the global scale to identify structural deficiencies, you probably need to do that on the fine scale as well, because these models are not perfect. They look really good. They have high fidelity, but they're not always particularly uh, well. You don't compare always well to observations, and they don't behave the same way. So I, I think we need to do all the work that we're doing on the global scale, also LES scale. Unfortunately, we can't just sort of use it as a as the test bed for developing global models, and it's not. I'd be naive. So this is just, uh, just to jump in, there's lots of useful chat going on in the Zoom chat windows. It's quite hard to follow. I wonder, uh, we, we can still use the, the effort pad for those who can access it. So if you want to discuss any of the themes that are coming up, uh, um, I, um, it'd be great to kind of capture it there. And there's a bit more of a, uh, a way for people to contribute back into questions that we may have moved on in, 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 the, in the conversation. There's a couple of themes that I'm keen to pick up on. One is, is, uh, is there any interest in appetite in a multi-model PPE approach? And we can look at that at multiple scales. Uh, and uh, I think it'd be really nice to come back to, uh, to this discussion about structural uncertainties. Uh, um, uh, and I wonder if I can do it in that order. Is it, are we happy with that? Uh, uh, in which case, uh, um, um, so uh, my, my, um, uh, we can we can talk about this on all kinds of scales. But, but my, my, I come from a global modeling perspective, um, and um, I, I just I've got a slide I want to show, and I think Salua has got I've got pre slides. Can, can, Salua, do you want to introduce some work you've done comparing uh, your PP and RPP? So Salua Petia will be talking tomorrow uh, for those who can make the time zone shift. Um, Okay, so you want me to share my screen? Yes, if you're happy to, that'd be great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, basically, I'm um, I'm a PhD student at Surfax now, and I've worked on the PPE of the CNRM model. But recently, I've also worked with uh, Ben and David uh, on the uh, kind of looking at cloud feedbacks in both PPEs, the one I did at CNRM and the Hagem three GA seven. And I look at cloud feedbacks and use the uh, radiative kernel method to try to decompose the cloud feedbacks depending on the cloud types. Uh, that depends on the cloud altitude and on the cloud optical thickness. Um, and uh, so here is just a quick results of what I've uh, seen. So here on the left, it's the CNRM PPE and on the right, the HGM3 PPE. Uh, the color bar are showing the PPE means and the dashed black lines are showing the full PPE ranges. And if we look at the total cloud feedbacks, it's just global means. Uh, we see um, net differences between both models in terms of the long wave uh, component of the feedbacks. And we see that it's mostly due to the high cloud uh, responses that have opposite signs uh, in both the PPE means, but also in most of the PPE members. Uh, so for CNRM, it's a positive long wave and negative short wave, and it's the other way around for the HM3 model. And I just did uh, some sensitivity analysis of the parameters of the both models to try to understand which what was the, the driving parameters. So on the left, it's the CNRM, and on the right, the HM3. So of course, the, the parameters perturbed here are not the same at all, but we can 
I kind of try to regroup them in the parametrization scheme they are used uh, to. Uh, and if we look at the high clouds, especially so the red triangle rectangles here, so these are the Sobol first order indices of the, so basically the contribution of the parameters uh, to the total variance uh, within the PPE. In CNRM, we have a large contribution of the macrophysics parameters in green. It's mostly ice macrophysics. But for hydrogen 3, uh, it's true for the high thin clouds, but it's less obvious for the medium and thick clouds, where it's more complex uh, contributions. Uh, so these are just some preliminary results, and I'll not talk too much. But uh, yeah, the idea was that maybe by using two PPEs uh, from two different models, we can learn about the well, the structural differences between the models and how is the, how the cloud feedbacks are impacted by the parameters. Yeah, that's it. So, so thanks, Salu. I think that's a really nice illustration. And, and sorry, we haven't given Salu a space to kind of um, present that. Um, so she's presenting the work of our own uh, RMPB tomorrow. Um, but there's a lot to dig in there. Uh, uh, and uh, a lot to understand, but I think it's a really nice illustration about how comparing PPEs across two models uh, uh, um, provides a, 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 an idea about structural differences. Uh, that they, the models are, are very confident about some things uh, and, and uncertain about other things, but they're not, not confident, confident about what to be uncertain about. And, and that, that kind of exposes the kind of different choices we make in our, in our parameterizations, if you like. Uh, uh, um, so I just want to provide a, a slightly, uh, a, a similar point. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen too. Um, so Ben, while you're doing that, did, did you agree on the parameters and trying to make them as similar as possible? Or did you just, are these two independent PPEs which were subsequently compared? Yeah, it's completely two independent PPEs. Oh, okay. but, uh, the, we kind of both perturbed some cloud parameters, uh, and there are some parameters that are perturbed in HGM3 and not in CNRM. Yeah, because we tried to compare, we tried to build a three parameter PPE for the aerosol in a multi model. It was so hard to agree on what the parameters were in different models. Is there an equivalent? And, you know, that was a really time consuming step. Um, Andrew Gettleman will remember that. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, yeah, if we wanted to coordinate this more in future, I think that would be a long step, a long process to come to some agreement on what the parameters would be. Or if you just kind of ignore that and just say, oh, you know, perturb your most important cloud parameters and just leave it there. I don't know. I'm, I'm not just to chip in. I'm not sure that was possible with us. Was it so well? Because like the convection schemes are completely different. What yours is turbulence based and yeah, yeah, no, no, so. models and different parameterizations. I just yeah. tried to regroup um, in terms of, yeah, where the parameters were playing a role, but uh, it's not obviously a perfect match. And I don't know if we can do that among different models. Yeah. No, I guess not. Yeah. Hmm. So, 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 my, so, my, so my, motiv my motivation for this is that I'm really interested in, in, in whether there's a potential for us to look at a, a, a multi-model PPE approach. And I've got a global atmospheric perspective, but we can broaden that out. Uh, and and kind of in terms of motivation, there's a, there's a and I've, I've lifted this figure from, from, from Benji's paper in 2018. Um, and so in that paper, they looked at a number of the more uh, uh, credible emergent constraints um, uh, that are resilient across different versions of CMIP. So this is uh, the, the Sherwood Low Tropospheric Mixing Index. Um, and and um, in Sherwood et al. 2014, they argued that higher sensitivity models um, uh, were consistent with the, the observations, which is the vertical dashed line in, in this panel. Um, but, but when you take one of those models and and you, put, you put, out the, put out the parameters, you can get a very broad range of response within just one of those model configurations. That, and that's the, the small dots in this case. And that kind of revealed that there's actually a much broader range of behavior that's uh, uh, in terms of climate sensitivity, which is a horizontal axis, which is consistent with that uh, uh, lower tropospheric mixing index. So it's kind of, there's a lot of traction, I think, in terms of thinking about how we make our own climate projections more, uh, robust, uh, more robust or more uh, less uncertain. And there's a lot of emphasis on, on the kind of climate, on, 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 on constraints like this. And I'm, I'm very interested in the potential that, that, that the, the PPEs that we each do uh, are, are able to 
expose the wider range of potential responses that are plausible. And I think we, we know that we have that information within the modern centres, but it doesn't feed through to okay, into the CMIC process, if you like. And and just to kind of uh, put our own uh, um, uh, our own model in that context. So uh, what I'm showing you on the right is is the same uh, 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 the same metric, the slow tropospheric mixing index. Uh, um, uh, along the horizontal axis, and I've got three generations here. Um, I think, um, uh, um, which which John talked about in, in his talk. So, the the red and the red density function is our zero six model, and and the blue and the green are the two more recent atmospheric configurations. And you can see there's a there's a broad range of of atmospheric feedbacks, which is the um, the 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 y axis, which, um, which are consistent with. With, uh, with, um, with our online model structure. Uh, um, so I just want to put that out there and see if there is an interest uh, across different modeling groups in, 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 in doing a more, uh, in, in collaborating along a multimodal PP approach. I was really interested to hear that in, in North America, there's already some coordination. Um, and I wondered if anyone had any comments on, on that. Uh, ben, I've got some a couple of slides here showing some preliminary results from a couple of multimodal PPEs. Great. A number of people here are involved in. This one is a, a cloud drop activation PP. You can see there's four models involved there, and we've perturbed five parameters to their extremes. Gives you an immediate sense there of the different sensitivities of those models to some of those different parameters. So the full PPE should be really informative. And in that case, we've perturbed things that are consistent across those models. And then this one is regarding a, a black carbon perturbed parameter ensemble. So only three parameters, but some black carbon absorption co coefficients and uh, emissions and removal rates. And again, sometimes the signs are uh, almost different, but definitely expecting plenty of potential there. And there'll be real interest in seeing when we constrain those PPs if there's an overlap in the combined parameter values across those models. Not quite the same as what you're talking about, but it's definitely gained interest from a number of different modeling groups. That's a different approach, isn't it? In, the, in, the, in that project, we've tried to identify common parameters rather than just say, go perturb all your important cloud parameters or aerosol parameters. We actually spent a long time trying to identify commonality. But yeah, that cannot be done for 45 parameters, but it can be done for three or four at a time, probably for a specific question. Both so, valuable, I think. So Marcus, um, do, do you want to share your slide on, on, on the LASP? Uh, um, uh, Single column model? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, okay, can you see this? Yes. This is just like uh, zooming in on a, on a post or, uh, that I made. So basically what, what I'm showing here is this is a single, uh, single column model case from uh, the GIS GCM, the GIS Model E GCM. And basically um, what's in gray are the 10th, 90th percentiles for um, the basically the Latin hypercube that we use to train our, our emulator based uh, sampling methodology. And then the red samples are the posterior samples that we uh, drew after doing the global constraint. So we've, we've taken those two sets of parameters sort of the prior and the posterior and fed them into the SEM. And so this is sort of a uh, motivation for us to try to look at, you know, do, does the SEM have value in picking out some, some aspects of a realistic behavior of the model? So this is obviously going at it in a forward sense rather than an inverse sense, right? We're not applying constraints within the SEM. We're just saying, okay, well, do our parameter choices look different for the SEM? And they do, and there's certain things that look a lot closer to um, the sort of accepted or the um, LES ensemble uh, values um, than the overall. So these are these are um, from I think a multi-model LES comparison. <clears throat> so I think there's some value there, and I think in general there's some value in 
thinking about um, how each model behaves in uh, between different SCMs and specifically when the parameter uncertainty is explored. So I, I, I think the SCMs could be a good tool for doing the um, model in a comparison in a focused sense that focuses on certain regimes of behavior that we think are particularly important for the, the models to capture and that, that um, involve important interplay between different model components. So um, one of the things that we're hoping to do is do this comparison between different models, um, you know, model E, hopefully uh, E3SM, um, and, you know, in, in collaboration with Andrew, CESM, uh, and the NASA GEOS model. Um, and most components of the model are different, um, but there is commonality in the microphysics, at least for now. Um, they all use the uh, MG2 uh, stratiform scheme. So I think there's, there's an interesting aspect of do we get sort of um, the same sensitivity for the same parameters given all the other variability and the other model components? Do we have sort of similar interplay between the microphysics and um, and other aspects of the, the model? So anyway, I, I think it's a it's a, it might be an interesting test bed to do some of this comparison. Um, and in so much as there's common components, I think th that can form a, a an interesting basis for comparison as well. Oh, by the way, we have a we have this for a bunch of cases. I'll just show the uh, the strata cumulus to cumulus transition because uh, <laughs> just to show that we did that one as well. So, in any case, um, I'll stop sharing now. So, 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 so thanks, Marcus. Um, uh, so, any comments on 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 the um, on the single column comparison? Um, um, if not. Um, Ben, I think you had a, uh, had a had a had a question or comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is just kind of thinking more broadly about CMIP and how this could fit in. And it, I, I get that the, the 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 SCM comparison is is really promising and interesting as well. And this could this this needs to be thought of in the same space. Um, but there's a, I mean, my my general thought is that the, the bigger that these ensembles are in terms of the the, the number of independent climate models that were being sampled, uh, the more useful, the, you know, the more useful they will be. Um, and so, you know, if there's already momentum between the US comparison effort, then is there some thought in just sort of like, you know, formalizing that experimental design or, and then deciding where we're going to put this? Um, you know, is the natural home of this thing in CF MIP? Is, would it be a MIP in itself? Um, you know, there's there's some you know there's, there's some precedent for doing certainly related sets of experiments within CFMIP. Um, and so if there could be some basics down there in the experimental protocol for CMIP seven for you know what would be in and out of scope for parameter sampling without being too prescriptive, because I've, as we've said, like there's no way to go as far as Ken's group did in 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 terms of matching parameter for parameter. But you know just broadly, what type of scheme do we want for turbing? Um, so, so Andrew first, then David, then Claudia. Um, no MIPS, please. <laughs> um, I, I think we actually have quite a bit of information and there's some commonalities rather than focusing on parameters, it's commonalities of what people are modifying and what the relative importance are. We talked a little bit about the difference between the CRM, CNRM and the, the HADGEM results where they're entirely different schemes. You can't come up with the same parameters, but you can still look at the impact of deep convection and how it plays into the different sensitivities for the cloud forcing. And there's some emergent things about you know tropical high clouds, shallow low clouds, even across scales of modeling from the LES to the global, where I think we could mine the experiments that people have done for some of these problems, like getting people to think about, okay, well, let's look across, let's look at cloud feedback and what people have done in these PPEs and what does that tell us? With what we already have, I think there's a lot that could be done there without having to actually run stuff again and, and just either having people share the data or share analysis methods and codes for how you access the data and come up with these relative variance plots and things like that. Just we could probably do a review of 
the relative variance for certain things across many of these PPEs in a common way that would add a lot of value and probably inform some of the analysis that people were doing. So, I mean, I think, was, I think we should just think about what we can mine with what's already existing rather than new protocols. That's, that's my two cents. So thanks, Andrew. Uh, David? Um, in many ways, my comments can be similar to Andrew's. Um, I think I can see what you're suggesting, Ben, but these are you know, quite big resource efforts. Um, we, the PPEs we run at the Met Office are often you know, for a purpose, we try to get in with modern development, um, but also a lot of it is about projection. So there's there's all that extra work that we've got to do after, you know, it's not just about the PPE. So I think, I, I agree with Andrew, I think we've got quite a lot here. And we, I think with what Sarah has done is um, a good start. I mean, she's pretty much given us an example of, of the sort of things we might like, look at. Um, so, I, I kind of, yeah, agree with Andrew on that. I think there's a lots of aspects about the methods. I think it's, you know, if we're going to organize ourselves, it's about how we share data, how we share methodologies, emulators or emulation algorithms. Um, and then I would say we ought to, if we're going to really show people the impact of the PPEs, we ought to pick a few key target aims that, you know, where we can demonstrate their value. Um, that people are missing. I think model development is is one because I don't think the model developers really think too much about, I would say, systematic errors across the whole parameter space. I think they look at their standard tuned model and say, well, that one looks, you know, not too different from the observations. So I'm happy with that error. Um, but when really underlying it, and we saw examples today, the PPE suggests actually the bulk of parameter space might look not very good. Um, we definitely saw a couple of examples of that. So I would I would say maybe work on how we share and and what we want to show with the PPEs that we've got ready. So, so I, I think both yourself and Andrew made really good points. Um, uh, I, uh, I guess to to kind of picture um, uh, an op opposing perspective is is that I think we we've learned a lot within our own communities about our models via using PPEs, but I don't think we've been very good as a PPE community in kind of exposing the wider like modeling uh, um, to that understanding. So uh, the Benji's plot, which I showed just now, is a great illustration that when you can get it out there, uh, uh, um, it's, a, it's a, a resource that kind of challenges some of the kind of the, uh, the, um, the ideas that emerge when you only have the kind of CMIT standard model variants to kind of explore. Um, and and I, I, um, so the kind of, I, I agree, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit we can do with what we've got already but 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 um how do we ensure that what we learn isn't just evident from a paper that one or two of the groups put together and it actually feeds through into that that wider um understanding assessment about about uncertainty and climate, climate models more generally i think that's what i meant by picking the right aims and the right targets in the right areas with what we want to do make impact somehow. Yes. Ben, uh, you've got a, a comment. I'm sorry I used the word MIP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, MIP has four letters. It's a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I take all that on board. I know, I know there are huge amounts of work, and I, and I, and I know that you know, the, 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 the idea of throwing away work that people have already done which is already massively useful is is, is, is anathema um i i guess I, I guess you know one point whether it's formal or not moving forward is it it having this communication already just here is very useful um and we want to ideally be be doing if we're all going to do amip experiments we should be doing and we, by chance, we have done so far, but we should be doing experiments which are intercom inter intercomparable. Um, you know, we want to, we're doing the same, the same SST perturbations, whatever. You know, just go that small. You know, if we're going to do the work anyway, uh, we should have that in mind. Um, but, um, but, 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 but also the in in you know in CMIP six the in the experimental design the 
the, the capacity was there to have different parameter configurations of, of, of Earth system models, and that, that capacity was not used to, to, to a large extent. Um, and so there, there is, there's potentially a middle ground here where you know, this community could be pushing to you know, contradict the idea that each, that each model is a unique position in, in, you know, in uncertainty space. Um, by by being by you know, for example, taking the E3SM effort, you know, aiming to have three different model configurations by 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 the by the time for seven. There's there's a perhaps there's a perhaps a middle ground uh, that we could be thinking about. So yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Get back to uh, Andrew's point. Uh, I think it's important to review what the community already have done. And uh, actually, the uh, template slide uh, everybody every, every present show in the first first slide already can give us a lot of information like what the simulation, what's the purpose, how many simulation, how many parameters, uh, output frequency, which can be used as a first step if somebody willing to lead this effort to summarize the community already have been done. But on the other hand, I can expect. Uh, if without doing co coordinated uh, model intercompression, if we, you, if we want to try to compare those different PPEs, you will find it very difficult because the purpose is different for each uh, PPE type, right? What, for example, what are you com going to compare? Some uh, PPE is designed focus on like precipitation, water cycles, some is like cloud process, some is radio, and also uh, radiative forcing, right? And the, serve to those different purposes, the output variables and the frequency, simulation time period, all could be different, right? It's, which make it very hard to make a fair comparison. That's why I think still, certainly, we, you know, we can look at those results already published or, or going to uh, do. But on the other hand, I think we'll focus on a few uh, selected parameters with a very well designed uh, goal. What, 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 what do I focus on? We focus on process level, cloud process, and also process, or focus on the future climate change projection. Uh, if we can well design coordinates, this I still think very uh, valuable to do. So, uh, so I think this is, uh, this is really excellent discussion. I'm conscious of time. We've got five minutes left. Uh, um, there's a really juicy topic about structural uncertainty, which PPs, I think, have a have a unique contribution to 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 um, to, to make. Um, uh, Ken, um, um, Yen, and 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 Leighton, what do you think we should do? Should we try and wrap up some strands here, or or, or should we um, open up a, another another topic? Um... Well, I think we all, I mean, uh, there's a lot of information in the, in the etherpad about structural. I think they could certainly pull a lot out of there. It's certainly one of the big topics earlier. Um, we probably don't have time to do it justice here right now, but I think a lot of people are interested in it. We can come back to it tomorrow. We have another day. Not everyone will, will be there again. Um, unless anyone has a burning point they want to make about it that we can bring to tomorrow and discuss further other than we probably need to do a bit more to use PPEs to uh, identify structural errors and feed it into model development. Can I make one comment? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Benjamin had his hand up first, but I'll make it, I'll make it super quick. My, my point is, is simply that PPEs are a prerequisite to structural error um, quantification. I think Jill basically made the same point. That, yeah. That, that, it's not the view that most people outside this community would hold. I, I think most people outside this community think they are orthogonal and that PPEs are just sampling parameters, whereas the real business is in uh, identifying structural errors, whereas we know that PPEs are actually the, the way to robustly identify structural errors. So we need to make that point. Uh, that, that needs to feed into something. I don't know what, but <laughs> we make it whatever article we write on this, that's going to be uh, in the abstract anyway. So, so, so Ben and David, uh, and then we'll, uh, I think we'll try and wrap things up for the day. So, so Ben, the floor is yours. So I'm not here tomorrow, but, uh, but I am very interested in this. Um, so I guess one thing I would encourage you to talk about tomorrow is vocabulary. 
um, because both amongst our community and amongst other, you know, the wider climate community, people mean different things when they say structural error. Um, you know, there's at least three different interpretations, one being like, you know, the literal parameterizations and equations which go into the climate model. Um, there was one interpretation today which was presented like, which is a geometric interpretation where, you know, the observations fall outside of your, you know, your parameter sampling convex hull. Um, and to me, there's a third one as well, where, where the, the, your, your, your model parameterization uh, space is failing to, you know, move in the direction of a given error at all. Um, so it's not just that you're failing to go in the direction, it's not that just the, your PPE isn't covering a, a type of observation, it's that you, you're failing to explore a relevant part of the space to explore it. Um, so yeah, we need to stop using structural error as a catch-all term for all, all, all of those things. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so thanks, Ben. So, so, so David, uh, a quick comment. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I actually forgot my original comment. I put my hand up quick. Someone remind me what someone was saying early on. But um, um, it, following on from Ben, I think it must be late. Um, yes, structural error can also mean systematic errors common to all parameter combinations. So it's something that all the model runs do in the PPE. Um, and also we have a best model assumption so the discrepancy stuff and the statistical frameworks is another angle at structural uncertainty and that can be that can be problematic as you know people have done things like john rostrum was talking about earlier on today so um yeah no structural uncertainty is is crucial i think my point oh yes i was going to say was gradually as i show or john shows more plots about PPEs to model developers, gradually they start to get the point that the errors in their tuned variant are not the same things as the structural uncertainty. They're not informative necessarily about the structural uncertainty. What they've done is almost they've tuned to counter as much of the structural uncertainty as they possibly can. Um, you know, that's the point of tuning, make the model look as close to the observations as possible. The problem is when they develop the model the next time, they start from where they ended up last time um, and they kind of kid themselves, I think, into thinking, actually, we've, we've solved the kind of long wave cloud forcing problem because, you know, we got close. We got reasonably close this time. But actually, um, the structural error suggests actually there's something underneath across most of the parameter combinations is actually a big systematic error and there's a big problem. Um, so I, but I think there's hope because gradually, I think the more we show, the the more they kind of get it. So it's worth doing. So thanks, David. And, and, and thank you for everyone uh, who's joined today. Uh, um, uh, um, just very briefly, my, my takeaways from the discussion was that there's there's lots of different groups, and it's not just us who are thinking mm -hmm. about how you couple aviate runs to, uh, to oceans. And um, if you, um, it sounds like there's an interesting kind of sharing notes on that. Um, um, so. That'd be a nice one to follow up. Um, it, um, uh, it sounds like there's some low hanging fruit in terms of uh, um, comparing what we've already done in, t in, on, in terms of the global uh, PPEs. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if, if Jan or, or, or Ken or Leighton, you want to jump in with any thoughts? Uh, oh, sorry. That's the end of the meeting, Ben. Right, uh, it is as a month. Yes, <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> so, so uh, ho uh, hopefully, some of you can make tomorrow. I appreciate it. it's a really nasty time for North America, um, but uh, yeah, it's been really good, very stimulating. This is really nice to get all these uh, people together with different science questions, but um, common techniques and uh, approaches. It's been really, uh, really stimulating. I hope you can join tomorrow. There's a lot more to come. I mean, uh, the same again, really. So not from the US, I guess. Just make sure to record it. We will. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Those are Ken, what's the product of the meeting? You know? The product? What's the intent? We want to write a, 
um, perspective position paper at least um other products seem to be emerging maybe a re what you were talking about earlier a review of existing ppes and what they currently tell us and etc that might be a, another product but i think we certainly need to write a position paper to inform the community this is what the wcrp would would like i think um i think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what ppes are and what they do and what they can provide and how they feed into other people's activities and i, I think we should write something that um spells that out a bit more clearly something that people might read i mean a lot of these ppe papers we all write are so heavy um they're not being read by people who are uninterested in them. So we need to write something that's engaging for people who aren't interested. That would be an outcome for me. And every, everyone is free to contribute. You know, we, we just, the people who are willing to put the effort into to write it would be uh, how we do that. Okay. So yeah, um, we'll uh, follow up that discussion by email, I guess, after tomorrow's, uh, session as well well done guys that was brilliant thank you thanks a lot everybody really good thanks everyone see you tomorrow Bye. thank you some of you